Today is November 12, 2010. I'm visiting with Calvin Anthony and the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And this interview is for the O State Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And uh, Calvin Galley, I, I want to thank you for taking time from your numerous duties and your busy schedule to, uh, to speak with us today. I know you've had a unique and a special relationship with Oklahoma State University over it really spans five decades now. Yeah. It goes fast, doesn't it? It doesn't but, seem like it. Yeah. We were in school together, Jerry. It doesn't seem like it's been five decades. Sure, it hasn't been that long. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's so many things we talk about. But, Calvin, could we just start a little bit with your early life, you know, where you grew up, a little sure. about your parents and your siblings and Absolutely. Your I, I actually was born in Amarillo, Texas, Jerry, and uh, uh, my family were, were kind of... Uh, my father's side of the family all were out West Texas people, mostly farmers, but uh, my father uh, actually operated a gross no country store there uh, for a, in a trailer park mm -hmm. when he and my mother got married. And my mother actually, first job she ever had was working in an ammunition plant during the war in Amarillo, Texas, and building, building bombs. And uh, so we moved to Oklahoma when I was about six years old, and we moved to Kearney, Oklahoma, a little town south of here, uh, about 25 miles. And that uh, was because my father uh, and mother decided that uh, they, were, they might try the cattle business. They had made enough money in the little country store that they could uh, buy some land down at Kearney. And my grandfather had already moved to that area, and so uh, they did raise cattle till the, in the early '50s. Ended up uh, not doing, you know, the drought came and they got scared that they were, you know, wasn't going to make it. So they uh, bought a store there, a general store in Kearney, sold groceries, dry goods, feed, hardware, you name it and were very successful in that store and me and I have four siblings. I have an older brother and I have three younger sisters and we all grew up in Kearney, went through Kearney Public Schools and all of us worked in that general store. It was, it was a very, very good experience for us. Taught us how to be around people, how to serve the customers and uh, Played ball through school there and uh, enjoyed uh, a really a good experience. Although there was there was twelve in my high school class, Jerry. So when I when I came to OSU, it was a big jump. We didn't have much background, and uh, so it was uh, that's you know was a big a big step. But my brother, who is three years older than me, had come to OSU before me, and so we were the first in our family to to get college educations. Is that kind of sure. what you needed? Kevin, can you tell me a little bit about some of the community activities you're involved in and school activities? Back in those days? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was, uh, I think, a typical probably junior high and high school student. I mm -hmm. started off uh, as about fourth grade. I, I, 4-H was my first experience mm -hmm. in any kind of learning any leadership skills or being around. I was the better grooming Captain Jerry. I, I laugh about that because, you know, I remember the, the, the motto, you know, heads, heart, hands, health, you know, for, for the 4-H club. But the better grooming Captain, I, when we'd have our chapter meetings, my responsibility was to get up and I would say stuff like, uh, well, uh, 22 boys combed their hair this morning, you know, and <laughs> different things like that. I guess I didn't, I don't know if that's exactly what the better grooming captain, then I moved from better grooming captain up to the games chairman, you know, where we'd have to come up with games for the, for our chapter meetings. And, and then I moved into FFA and that really, uh, besides being an athlete and playing whatever sports, little school only had a couple of sports, basketball and baseball, and I, I, I proved to be pretty good at both of those, but uh, in my other activities. I was president of my junior and senior class, and I was, uh, I was the, uh, you know, FFA. My ag instructor got me into public speaking. I know it doesn't show now with this interview, but I actually 
got where I could uh, could talk with people and I could speak publicly and I was successful winning a few speech contests and gave me some confidence. I actually won a trip um, in one of the contests, a farmer's union to Washington DC and New York City, a two week trip on a bus. I got to meet Senator Kerr and Carl Albert and Oklahoma's delegation back as a junior in high school and that was quite a quite an experience for me. And anyway, those were some of the things. On the stu we had a little student council and stuff and, and then I played summer baseball, played American Legion baseball and 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 and, and played basketball all the way through school and uh, had you know, actually had scouts uh, who for the Phillies who approached me about playing baseball when I was a junior and senior in high school. We went to the state championship game in my junior and senior, my junior year, my senior year we got to the last four in this championship game. I struck out 21 batters and we got beat in extra innings and <laughs> one run. But, but I, uh, anyway, I, that, was a, that was a long time ago, but a scout came the next day to the house and that was big news in Kearney, you know, when something like that happened. Kevin, were you, weren't you an All-State baseball player? I was an All-State baseball player, Jerry, uh, and and might have made it in basketball, too, if I broke my foot the my senior year, about halfway through the season, and so uh, I didn't get to play the last part of it. But I, I was, you know, as a little guy, I could shoot the ball. I, we didn't have the three-point line when I was growing up. I, I might have still been playing if they'd had that, Jerry. <laughs> no, but but I did. I made all state, and that was back, Jerry, when they only had one all state team for the entire state, regardless of class. It was quite a, unusual for a uh, someone of a little class C. It was class C then was the level Carney was that someone would make the all state team, and I was actually the winning pitcher in the all state game, and we pitched. Uh, Freddie Mulder, who later came to OSU, uh, uh, was my catcher on that team. And uh, several of the boys that came to OSU and played, Donnie Kikendall from Anadarko and, and uh, a guy named Gary McCord who played here at third base and stuff, they were all on that same team. Kevin, were there some, some uh, values, you know, some principles that you learned growing up from your family and being in a small town that helped you later in your life? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I've, I've always had a, a fondness for small town uh, students, and uh, I, I guess it's because of my background and not anything, not prejudiced against big schools or anything like that. They do a great job. There's a lot more of selection of coursework and all those kinds of things. I recognize that. But the small town, what I think it gave me was a pride in, in uh, succeeding that uh, you felt like, Jerry, that if you failed, for example, you know, it was a ball game or whether it was going to college and flunking out, that I was letting down my family and my town. And so you, you wanted to succeed. And so I don't know that you always get that in the larger communities, but that was a key to part of my success, I think, if I've had any. And I think the other things that I learned was particularly working in that old country store alongside my brothers and sisters and my mother and father was how to treat people. My folks were insistent. It didn't matter if it was the banker that drove the Cadillac or the black gentleman who came in with mules, that we treated them all just the same, no matter what. And that is a valuable, valuable lesson that, that I hope my kids learn. And, uh, it's it's you know the basic your, your basic personality and value system is molded in many of those ways or at least mine was and uh, I was lucky and fortunate uh, that even though my family w were not educated people they wanted that for my brother and me and my sisters and they just presumed that we were going to go to college from the time we started you know growing up and uh, and we expected us to, and then when the you know my brother and I both had scholarship offers from OSU, and and uh, you know we're lucky that we could afford to go to to college, but those values, just common decency, 
and the will to succeed uh, were th they molded us because when I came to OSU Jerry I did not have the chemistry background I did not have the only science that I had had was a general science class didn't have botany didn't have any biology didn't have even have trigonometry I had to to pass physics I had to learn by by a trigonometry book and study it and learn what sine and cosine and those kinds of things so I started out as a disadvantage in my schooling at OSU but because my family had taught me the work ethics that I knew I was going to do whatever I had to do to succeed and I spent a lot of time in this building, the library, where we are right now. And in the end, when the grades came out, I, I did better than I expected and, uh, and actually graduated, you know, uh, uh, from pharmacy school amongst the top five or six in my class. Okay, I'm going to just talk about it. You talk about Oklahoma State. Uh, you know what was? Uh, did you get a scholarship offer in baseball to come to Oklahoma State? Yes, I actually, I, I it was kind of funny. I, I had a, uh, a, you know, in baseball they don't give you just a full ride as a rule. They split the scholarships up. A guy named Dale Dehart, who was a, Toby Green's assistant coach, he played third base here years ago. And Toby was the head coach. Toby was the, Toby Green was the head coach and. Uh, they saw me, they, he was at the All-State game that I pitched in, and he saw me, I was playing for Chandler's American Legion team, and he came down and, and talked to me, didn't, didn't offer me a scholarship at that time, and then at the All-State game, after that game, they, he came up and said they'd like to talk to me about coming to OSU, and, and did actually a, a visit a little bit, and you know, I knew I was going to come. Any, I mean, one way or the other, because OSU, uh, it was close, and we were all OSU fans and loved uh, Stillwater. So I, I, uh, when he offered, he didn't offer me a full ride, but uh, uh, enough to where it was worth the time. And uh, I lived over in uh, West Bennett, which is where the athletes. You probably stayed there. I suspect. I don't know, but a lot of the, a lot of the team players did and uh, it was I played for Toby my first year those days Jerry the freshmen were not eligible right. and we mainly just you know worked out and shag balls and you know helped out it was we would practice of course but then my sophomore year I played uh, we started fall baseball and I played through uh, the first semester and uh, and coach then was Chet Bryant. It was his first year. I can tell you some funny stories about Chet if you need those, but very interesting time. And, and uh, he, uh, when I decided to go to pharmacy school, I went to his office and told him, I said, uh, coach, I, I'm, I just want to be up front because I'm, I'm going to transfer and uh, it'll, you know, not, and, and a, OU had the pharmacy school, and I was working at Tiger Drug, one of my businesses uh, at that time, as a student. And I said, he said, well, he said, I'll use, you lose a year of eligibility. But he was gracious, but he did not play me anymore after that. <laughs> and so, so that was, I, I understand that. And so it was, uh, but it was on good terms. And uh, so then I transferred at the end of that year um, to the University of Oklahoma. But, but, Chet in practice, one of the times that he, I'll always remember was uh, we had a all big eight performer named Donnie Bumpus. And Donnie was a pretty good shortstop. And you may remember him, Jerry. But anyway, I was pitching bat in practice, you know, and I hit Donnie right in the, didn't hit him in the head, but the shoulder or something. And Chet come running out of the, on the field, say, what's going on, you? crazy freshman, you know, uh, and, 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 and yeah, I think the word he used was hot dog. I think he said, he said you hot dog. <laughs> and anyway, uh, uh, there, there were a lot of this Chet Bryant stories, but, uh, but my career was not so good. But, I, I, but, but uh, out of high school, you know, uh, I, I thought that I could, you know, when you're young and, and pretty good, then you know, and the Phillies were talking to me about, 
you know, hey, uh, we may want you to sign you, you know. But I was so proud that my dad insisted that I go to college, and uh, he was much wiser than me. <laughs> yeah, but I want to get to that. Let me back up just a little bit about your OSU experience. You were here yeah. a couple of years. I was here a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. pharmacy school is like a two plus three Two program. plus three program at that time, five year program, and then you also had to do an internship of uh, like almost a year. So, it now is a six year program, but it was five year then. So, out of the two years here, were you involved in any OSU? I know you were busy with working. Uh -huh. Ball and so on, but did, were you engaged in any OSHA activities, organizations, uh, uh, student groups? To some degree, uh, but as you said, with baseball, the uh, the there was, you know, you were busy. It was a busy, busy time, and I worked uh, when I could over at Tiger Drug. I had started working there when I thought I had an interest in pharmacy, but. Uh, I was involved in intramural sports. Uh, I, I, basketball was kind of a first love for me, any, even Jerry then, and so I I actually led the the league in scoring in the intramurals uh, the year that uh, I played basketball the, my my sophomore year, and uh, and I I messed with those kinds of things, played uh, flag football and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I also was involved in, uh, my roommate one year was uh, involved in the student government. And uh, he ran uh, for the president of the Student Government Association, his name Bob Bird. And so I uh, helped, you know, got involved in that aspect, just helping him actually. But uh, those were the main things between ball and between the, you know, Playing a little intramural stuff, and and of course I attended all the functions, you know, homecoming. I helped decorate, uh, did those late night deals, you know, on those floats that we do, and, and uh, decorated and stuff like that, like all the other students. But great, great memories. Kevin, did 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 you know when you when you came to OSU that you wanted to be a pharmacist and you worked for Tiger Drug? You went to pharmacy school. Did you know when you got here? Where, where? Uh, no, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I'll give a lot of credit to my brother who was a little older than me, and mm -hmm. he had decided he wanted to be a doctor. And of course, neither of us had a background, and he he ended up uh, coming up here, and he actually was an assistant in the lab, comparative anatomy lab, and and I knew that I following him, I, science was areas I wanted to be in. So I enrolled as a pre-dental major. And uh, I, I have felt like that that was an area that, that I would like. Mm -hmm. But they did, there wasn't a dental school in Oklahoma at that time. So I knew I'd have to go out of state. So after my freshman year is when I really decided, and I had worked a little bit at Tiger Drug, just mm -hmm. soda jerk type things, you know, mm -hmm. cleaning up. And so that is what made me decide I'm going to switch from dentistry to pharmacy. I can stay in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and go to OU or Southwestern and get a degree. And I had a good friend who was a graduating as a pharmacist that I knew, and he encouraged me. And so that's, it was really after my freshman year that I made that decision. And uh, it was a good decision as it turned out. Kevin, did, did you, uh, on a personal note, did you meet your your current wife, Linda, your current and only wife? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that way. right. But, but Linda, did you meet here at OSU? Actually, I, we didn't meet here at OSU. Uh, Linda attended OSU, but mm. uh, we she is from Chandler, which was when being from Kearney, that was uh, Chandler was the big city you went it's to. County so, seat there. Yeah, it's a county seat in Lincoln County, so. Is about 3,000 people, and so Linda was in school there. And Linda's actually a few years younger than me, so I, she was not in she was not in college when I came to OSU, and and uh, so she we, we actually met at church. We were of the same faith, and so uh, I knew her family, and she had two older sisters who I know I knew actually better than her, but uh, but she. Uh, we got we got acquainted there, and then the baseball diamond at Chandler, which is where I played a zillion games, was across the street from the church that we went to. And my folks, of course, they were sticklers for us kids going to church. So a lot of times, if there was games, you know, I'd have to take my ball suit and I'd go to church there in Chandler, and then suit up for the game there right across the road. Well, uh, 
I, that's where I ran into Linda, and we've now been married 42 years, Jerry. <laughs> so oh, so uh, I fooled her or something. I'm not sure what happened. That was your curveball. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, Kevin, what, you talk a little bit about your, your experiences at the pharmacy school there at the University of Oklahoma. So that would have been the fall of 65? 65. 65. Fall yeah. of 65 is when I when I enrolled there, Jerry, and uh, and scared to death, I'll always remember my folks taking me down there. I didn't have a car or anything, and they let me out at this, there was apartments really where they put me instead of the dorm. There was some brand new apartments called Crately Apartments there, and I didn't know my roommates or anybody, and my folks let me out, and uh, you know, it wasn't like coming to OSU, I had, I knew, people here and I had no connections down there and so I remember feeling really lonely that that first day and that week when I saw my mom and dad and family drive off I thought I don't think I don't think I'm gonna make it. Kevin but, back that reason was your application process you had to go through? Yes sir you had to go through and it was it was a rigorous uh, I went down and talked to the Dean uh, and my brother uh, actually who was in medical school at the time uh, took me down there and, and uh, I went in and spoke with the dean, told him I was interested and talked to him about the school and then I went through the process. Uh, I fortunate, fortunately I had decided that after my freshman year, so my sophomore year here at OSU, uh, I was able to pick the courses that I knew I needed to, to, to meet the requirements for the pharmacy school and I had to take one extra, I think, uh, uh, distance course, uh, I can't remember to the course's name, but I remember doing it during the summer to uh, fulfill all the requirements. But I was accepted, uh, had to have a pretty good, I think 2.5 minimum grade point to, to get accepted to pharmacy school at that time. I think it's up to three point now, but that was the requirement then. And, and I exceeded that, and then they, uh, you know, he had to meet the other scholastic requirements. But it was, it's a very rigorous, uh, I've been on a, the admissions board down there several times on relating to pharmacy students now, but uh, but it's it was it was difficult, but it wasn't as hard as getting into medical school. Now it is about the same. Does that kind of answer that, Jerry? Yeah. So Kevin, you were there then three years. I was there three years. That's in Oklahoma and City. In, it was in, well, actually, the first when I enrolled and started there in '65, it was in Norman. But my senior year was the first year that they had started moving classes to Oklahoma City to the Health Science Center. I, my, I was the first class to have courses on the Oklahoma City campus. And so that was the beginning of that transition. And, and then I, had, I worked, and one of the reasons that I went to OU was I was still working in Stillwater on weekends at Tiger Drug trying to make a little money, you know. And uh, and so uh, I would drive, a lot of times, you know, and uh, I, I mean, I'd come to Stillwater and work on the weekends and then go home and I'd stay at home at Kearney, you know, it's close. And then, and then when I graduated, uh, I knew I wanted to own my own business. I had just, my family background, had, I think, made me wanting to do that. And so, uh, I was just out of, when I came to OSU, my, my, uh, in 68 when I graduated, there was, you know where Charlie Fowler's consumers, that used to be a Humpty Dumpty, and they had a pharmacy in there. And so they hired me to work as a pharmacist there, and Linda started OSU. She was just finishing high school when I was finishing pharmacy school, and so she uh, enrolled at OSU. We lived over the, here in a little old apartment right near, actually it was Williams Boarding House then, now Stan Clark's operation is there, but you remember Williams Boarding House, they'd serve that food. Well, we lived right near there, paid $60 a month rent, and uh, thought we were really doing fine, you know, and Linda was in school and I was working, and I will always remember we had, uh, I was getting paid $1,000 a month which we thought was astronomical, you know, and I my check take home pay was four about four hundred twice a month, and we lived on one check and saved the other one, and uh, before we knew it, we had enough money to, to 
buy a house and make a down payment and stuff like that. But anyway, I may be going further than you want to go on this, but what I would say is that we were there. I worked at that Humpty Dumpty for about six months. And the felt the gentleman, older gentleman that owned Tiger Drug was named Elmer Phillips. One time there was five Tiger Drugs in Stillwater that he owned. He had consolidated them down to that one store by the time I went to work for him. But anyway, he liked me because I when I was there as a student and so forth. And so he approached me about buying that store. Well, I knew it was a, a good business, but I didn't have any money. And so we, Linda and I talked about it, and uh, and I talked to my dad, who was a businessman down at Carney, who still ran that, that old store. And uh, I, to come up with a down payment, Mr. Phillips agreed to help do some creative financing a little bit, but I still had to have money to pay down. And my dad co-signed the note for me, and I uh, got enough money from to do that and uh, I remember being so scared I'd never really been in serious debt before and Linda I was 23 and Linda was 19 mm -hmm. and we were or maybe she was 18 but we were we were both just looking back I didn't realize how little we really did know <laughs> but we knew enough to work hard mm -hmm. and uh, our store was open eight to nine and I worked almost all the time and uh, it's 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. And uh, we paid that business off in four years. Wow. And then everything was downhill after that, Jerry. I mean, once you proved yourself and I felt comfortable I could succeed and, and uh, everything just fell into place and we've been very lucky ever since. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let me back up. I meant to ask you a couple yeah, questions sure. about OSU. Right. At, at that time, was what were kind of the favorite student hangouts on campus at that time? The, the and, big and, thing and, and off campus. Yeah. As well. well, I tell you what, the big the big place you know was that on campus mm -hmm. where you know, I, and I was telling somebody this the other day because they're remodeling the student union now. Mm -hmm. You know, was the big eight room mm -hmm. up on the fourth floor. I bet you spent a little time there, Jerry. Well, we'd come over. I'd come to the library almost every night, and uh, I got enough discipline to, to do that because I, otherwise I'd fill it away. And I'd I would uh, I would uh, have a I'd have a, you know work till about ten o'clock studying or whatever. Then we'd go over there and to the big eight room, you know, and they had a booth and there was a little dance floor and stuff like that. And but you know I would. I didn't know how to dance anyway, so I couldn't dance. But I, you know, kids were all gathered in there, and they had a bowling alley down in the basement, as you know. And so the student union in that area, and there was a, eventually a terrace out there too. But that was where you know the hangout really, I think, is in terms of the student at that time on campus. Uh, off campus, I think probably where we would spend a lot of our time. Of course, on Washington Street, there was a. Dewey's Pizza Parlor, which is down there near where Dupree's was, as an old, that was a, a place that people hang out, hung out. And then the Coachman and some of those other places along Washington Street. Uh, uh, yeah, uh -huh, mm -hmm. that's right. And then I actually, the place I, I, we, I ended up, a, a lot of the people who lived off campus or uh, there was a uh, Sandy's Hamburgers. I don't know if you remember that place, but you you get five hamburgers for a dollar, and we'd go in there, you know, and eat because it was so cheap, you know. And then right downtown, across from the Leachman, you remember the Chicken House? They called it the Chicken House. We'd go at midnight. You could get breakfast there. I mean, it was open all the time, and you could get breakfast there at midnight. We'd go in there and eat pancakes, you know, and uh, those. Anyway, those were some of our favorite hangouts. <laughs> I bet everybody, everybody had their own places, you know. Kevin, when you were there, just of course a couple years still older, but were there any professors or even faculty staff members that influenced your development as a student that were important to you? Yes, uh, I think so. I, I will tell you that uh, the the best thing that I, you know, the first thing that struck me was my my advisors. My advisors when I came were uh, Dr. Calvin Beams and uh, Dr. Hurst, who were in the 
they're in the physiology and in the science area. Both became customers at Tiger Drug long after I finished school. But uh, they were good influences. When I thought about what I wanted to do, they were encouraging me, you know, to stay in the science field. And Dr. Hurst wanted me to stay in physiology. Mm -hmm. He think I think that would be a good thing for you. You like anatomy and stuff like that. But, but uh, uh, they counseled me well, and I appreciated uh, when I decided to go to pharmacy school. They helped me. But in terms of, prof there was two people as a professors that were big help, I think, to me, being such a young and green. One was a lady named Virginia Lippert, and Jerry, I bet you remember her. She always had an affinity for athletes, and she really oversaw the chem. I was having to take Bukusa chemistry to get my stuff that I needed. Well, I had no, I had never had chemistry in high school. I mean, I was starting off from ground zero, but in the labs, she oversaw the lab work, and she helped me and made sure that I got the necessary help and un, to, to, to really grasp the subjects. And then uh, the other person who taught me organic chemistry, <laughs> which was the hardest class I ever had anywhere, was a lady named Ruth Gerber. And Ruth was unique in this regard. She was a great teacher, but she had very poor eyesight. So one of her very basic requirements was that you had to use a black pen or felt tip pen to write equations and stuff and it had to be very dark because and and she would mark you to off if you if you didn't follow that instruction but because i've often thought maybe that's the reason i got by i used the right pen but maybe she couldn't read some of them i don't know but she was a wonderful teacher she was uh she was she demanded excellence most people flunked that course. Uh, I was in there with people who were trying pre-med students, pre-vet students, uh, pre-dental and pharmacy, and they are all students and a lot of them had to repeat it. Uh, I was lucky. I made a C and I thought I was about as tickled about that as most A's that I've ever made. <laughs> so <glad> to get <laughs> That's it. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what as a student, can you looking back? I know it's been a lot of a lot of years. Yeah. Do you have some favorite memories of your time as a student at Oklahoma State? Oh yes, uh, you know I do. I mean, it was a great time. You know, the best. The thing about it is, you don't realize it always at the time, Jerry. You know, but uh, when I started, uh, you know, I I was. The greatest driver for me was the fear of failure. Like I told you earlier, I, being, you know, having, I don't know, in our family, my brother had done well, and and all of our family had seemed like they count on you to to do well and and expect it. And uh, there was a times that I had that doubt: can I can I do this or can I make it? I hope I can. And but I I think uh, the memories of uh, you know, going to class, uh, uh, I always had pretty good clothes because my family in that old country store, my mother, m you know, we sold dry goods, shoes, underwear. We sold everything in that little country store. So mother made sure me and my siblings had good clothes. Yeah, well, what was the name of the store? I, mean, I didn't ask An you earlier. It was Anthony's Grocery Dry Goods and Feed. <laughs> <laughs> and we had three different buildings there on Main Street of Kearney. And uh, I'll tell you one funny story just kind of because about this time, I, you know, when I went off to school, well, I, uh, I'd i wear Bermuda shorts. Boys, you know, growing up, never, that just wasn't something farm, you know, kids did. But college, you know, kids a little more relaxed. It wasn't unusual to have a pair of thongs and a pair of Bermuda shorts. Well, I was home on a weekend there one time, and we had a gentleman who was a customer, uh, and so we, we he always bought feed for hogs and chickens, and he had asked Miss Anthony, he was blind to some degree. He wasn't completely blind because he drove mm -hmm. to town, but he did draw the pension for being, being blind. But anyway, he couldn't see great very well. But anyway, he had, 
my mother, one day I was there in the store and he wanted a couple of hundred, two 100 pound sacks of corn. And she said, well, Calvin, would you mind just not loading that for him? Well, he, had, I had learned how to carry a, a hundred pound sack of feed on my shoulder and one on my hip. If you do it just right, you can, you can do it. And then I just dropped them into his trunk. You know, I came out of our feed house with him. And he was out there watching me, you know, and so then he went in the store to pay my mother for that feed and he's and he knew that I have three sisters and he looked at my mother and he said, Miss Anthony, I just wanna tell you, you've got the strongest daughter I've ever seen. <laughs> and he he thought it was one of my sisters because he had never seen a man in shorts, you know, and he just couldn't imagine that there would be a somebody in shorts. But anyway, uh that that a little bit of a side point, but but I, good memories, Jerry, and and it and at OSU, you know, we had the, the during the week or on the weekend. I mean, there was just being around the gang. One of the people that I knew nothing about wrestling when I came to OSU, but one of the fellows, the athletes who was in my quadrant, kind of there, we shared bathrooms. You know, was a wrestler named Gene Davis. And we became good friends, and I got to be a fan because uh, Gene was, I admired him so much. Uh, even though I was playing sports and having to do conditioning and stuff, Gene was just, I mean, those wrestlers, they ran those stadium stairs, and I mean, Iron Roderick put them through it, I mean, and they were they were tough. Well, he went on to be a two, not, two or three-time national champion, won a silver medal in the Olympics, but... Anyway, he got me interested in in the in the uh, uh, wrestling area. Mm -hmm. So, and I, to this day, I, I love to watch wrestling. And we, the best memories of that I enjoyed was going to the other ball games. I mean, baseball, yeah, that was fun. I mean, I was mm -hmm. playing, but I loved to go to the basketball games. We won, you know, uh, Jim King and Gene Johnson and Larry Hawk. Uh, Gary Hassman, all those boys, those were in my era, you know, those guys. And so we had good basketball under Mr. Iba. And Mr. Iba actually talked to me about playing, you know, but I didn't have time. I, could, I was lucky to be able to play a little baseball, but uh, I would have loved to have done that probably, but uh, those guys were better than me. Well, thanks for stepping back a minute with me. I, no, I, I been. Good, good memories all the way across. and. Homecoming, as I said, we always, you know, uh, Jerry had a had had worked a, on a float, and we'd stay up like everybody else all night and try to, you know, get her, get it ready for the Bennett Hall was, was where we were. Kevin, we talked a little bit uh, earlier about your your person, your first drug store. Was it the yes. hum Humpty store was it? No, well, I worked there, but worked I didn't own it. I was just working as an employee, and then, and then I drug. bought. T I work only worked there about six months, okay. and I knew that I, like I said, I had in mind I was looking for a store that I like that I could buy when I I was saving money. I you know as much as I could, and uh, but then that one popped up at Tiger, and it was like a dream come true. I knew I had worked there as a student. I knew it was a good store. Kevin, you have uh, you know, we talked about earlier when you decided you would be a pharmacist. Yes. But when you decided to be a pharmacist, did you also have the plan to be a businessman and to own your pharmacies? To, yes, I. It seemed like early on you you were. I've always, direction. I've always, uh, uh, I think it was probably my family background, but mm -hmm. my family they were merchants, as I mentioned. But I've always, my grandpa used to have a saying. He said, "Son, I don't care if you are pushing a wheelbarrow, as long as it's your own wheelbarrow." You know, and I thought that sort of always stuck Great. with me, you know, and so I wanted to own my own house. I wanted to own my own business. And I, and, you know, I don't think, Jerry, we, we start, we, I, don't, I don't think I ever started off thinking I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that in terms of how successful I would be. Uh, the good Lord has just blessed us, frankly, because I think a lot of it is just flat good fortune, you know, but, but when the I wanted to own my own store and I knew that and then when Tiger came available to me I had to really work to get the money to to do it but I knew that it was a good thing and I knew that I thought I could run it but you know being 23 uh, you know you, you can think that but you don't know that till you really prove even to yourself but 
then after I got that paid for, you know, worked out the financing and got it paid for, well, it was easy. I, I started three other stores from scratch, one at Perkins, one at, uh, at uh, Yale, and they're still very well operated stores, and now I have young men that, that work for me, I've sold them to them, and then I started a home health care business, a separate business here in Stillwater Tiger Medical that, from scratch, and I mean, they've all proven to be very successful, but it was, it was a big step to take, you know, I thought I may never get out of debt, but you know, the fear of failure, it, it makes you work hard. And you paid it off in four years. Paid it off in four years. Right. And then that store, which is now I'm 42 years later, we celebrated two years ago. The drug, Tiger Drug is is the third, uh, or four, third oldest business in Stillwater, continuously operated. Mm -hmm. wow. And we celebrated 100 years in business two years ago. Uh, Stillwater National Bank and the mill mm -hmm. are both older mm -hmm. than, than Tiger Drug. Well, Kevin, can you talk a little, just sort of briefly, some highlights of your professional business career from the time you you, you were kind of getting in at some sure. of the pharmacies you operated and so on, but can you talk about that for a couple minutes? Sure, I'd be glad to. The, the thing, we, you know, once, as I said, once I had my feet on the ground with a store at uh, mm -hmm. Tiger, I eventually uh, well, I had six or seven stores at one time, Jerry. I had Central Drug down on Main Street. We owned it for over 20 years. I started the store in Perkins and uh, owned it for over 20 years. Uh, the store in Yale, same way. I started it a couple of years after I started the one at Perkins. I owned a store in Perry and didn't own it all that long. Uh, one of my friends, uh, actually I bought it kind of I wouldn't say by default, but my uh, classmates in pharmacy school passed away. He, Chris Cockrum, he owned the store, and he'd always told his widow, if something happens to me, go see Calvin, you know, because he knew I uh, had several stores, and so she did. He passed away unexpectedly, and so uh, as a courtesy to her, I, I, I bought the store and uh, operated it for several years, and then I had the medical supply also. And all through all those, it was, you know, those years, it was just a matter of, I never wanted to over, I had to make a decision kind of professionally, Jerry, uh, at the time, I, there was some push and some, you know, thoughts, I could have gone public and made a, uh, had some chances to do a, you know, a large chain, but uh, I was, I got I ended up getting involved a little bit in community service stuff, I was mayor of Stillwater and ended up being a legislator and I just didn't feel like I had the time to to do that. I had to professionally decide uh, what exactly I wanted to do and then I got involved in our National Pharmacy Association which took me a, to another whole area of, of work and uh, but but my business is the, the, the drugstore, Tiger specifically, it has been a what it has allowed me to do is it has provide a comfortable income to me and my family and really to utilize that some of those resources to to invest and do in other things. I was at one time, for example, the chairman of the board of of the the Stillwater Savings Bank, you know, for fifteen years and being involved in other community activities and other business areas. Can you talk about some of those, Calvin? Uh, you were very much engaged in community activities, mm -hmm. the chamber, uh, the yeah. city commission. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about some of those th yeah. uh, up through the time that you, you know, left Washington, D.C.? Sure, I'd be glad to. I, You know, you never start out intending to do, you know, mm -hmm. be a mayor or be a this, I don't think, at least I didn't. But uh, people in the community, Chris Salmon, uh, I was just you know, working behind the pharmacy counter, doing, you know, my businesses were successful and I, we were doing well and raising a family. And then I ended up, uh, Chris Salmon got sick and was dying of cancer. And some people asked me, would I consider running for mayor? And I said, well, hadn't thought about it, but I did. And I won. And that was back in the mid 80s. And, uh, and I really enjoyed that service to the community. I viewed it, it was a nonpartisan race and 
you know, it was more a way. My dad was always involved in his little the little community down there on the town board and stuff and school board, and he taught us we need to give give back if you know it's part of the deal. And anyway, I I got involved in that, and then a couple after I finished my term there, I got uh, I ended up being in, as a elected as a on the vice chair and stuff of the Na our National Pharmacy Association, mm -hmm. National Community Pharmacists mm -hmm. Association, which is a big organization that uh, it represents about 75,000 pharmacists and about mm -hmm. 25,000 mm -hmm. pharmacies across the country. I, the headquartered in Washington, D.C., and I know you visited, which I later ended up <laughs> Surprisingly, I was elected president of that. I mean, as a volunteer, you know, person. There's a board that oversees the operation, and then after my presidency of that, I, they, uh, the CEO retired, and they asked me to take over the come to Washington. And by that time, I had ran for public office here in Stillwater. The our our state representative had gotten sick again. Uh, Larry Hansen had been, uh, Larry Gish had been the, our state representative and then he had he'd become ill and Larry Hansen had replaced him. Well, Larry had some health issues pop up so he didn't rerun and uh, here again I, they asked me to run and I said I'd do it and I did and, and I won and served two terms in the legislature enjoyed that experience uh, my focus i being a healthcare knowledgeable somewhat in healthcare policy i did most of the legislation uh in healthcare stuff and education and then 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 when i they asked me to take that ceo job i had to make a decision do i want to stay in politics here or go go to Washington. I was kind of in line. I would have had a good shot to be speaker. Well, I was going to back up and ask that, Kevin. Could you tell me a little because you, you were assistant majority I was assistant leader. majority floor leader and uh, and was and enjoyed the work uh, and I was fortunate in that they gave me good assignments and, and I got along well. I, I always was a bipartisan type guy. I never strong on one side of the other party politics in general and and uh, and it was we got some things done, and I was torn. I really, in fact, I talked to my wife, and and our children were growing up, and and we had mixed feelings. It meant I'd have to go to Washington, and uh, and tough and decision. Tough decision. Yeah. But my profession was always important to me, and there were things that we needed in pharmacy that I thought I could help deliver politically in Washington, and healthcare policy stuff and and I I really didn't know what was the right decision and I, I, I was torn but I had been had two terms didn't have an opponent even the second term and I think was well respected enough to where I would have not had any trouble getting reelected but I made the decision that trying to do some key things in my profession that needed to be done might be more important for me than um, than politics. There's I knew things it, you could have yeah. done there too as well. That's right. right. There were some things I could have done here, and it was a close call. And but there's parts of that that's that is you have to you know rerun. Uh, you're raising money. My family. It's hard on your family. No matter how honest or good you are, people can you know you're not going to make everybody happy. And uh, so. I came down on the side of doing some stuff for my profession. So we kept our home and businesses here, but we moved to D.C. for uh, my, two of our children were out of high school and in college or, or out of college here at OSU. All of our kids have graduated from OSU. And um, so we decided to do that. And it was a not a bad decision, a wonderful experience. Uh, I, I had access to the White House and really was involved in health care policy and some very interesting you travel worldwide on you know on issues and ended up being kind of uh, uh, very uh, it, it was educational for me but I think I also helped 
improve the plight of pharmacy in, the, in America with some of the decisions there. So, Kevin, if I understand, right. kind of speaking for you, Bragging, you a little bit, I know you were really, because of your, you'd served on several key committees and then been president right. of the association as a, from the volunteer, I mean, as a right. working pharmacist. And then in your role, I know you had been asked to speak at several state level, national level Absolutely. groups and committees. I think a lot of uh, politicians, political leaders had mm -hmm. asked you to, to give advice on issues talking about health care. So yeah. There must have been a lot of satisfaction in being able to do those kinds of things. Well, it was. I, I you know, and when you go through these things and you, you work and learn, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, no one I don't think knows all the answers when they start out, mm -hmm. Jerry, but it did. It I, Doors opened for me that I, in my wildest dreams, I couldn't imagine. Mm -hmm. A little kid from Kearney, Oklahoma, having access to the White House and the president sitting here just like we are, saying, Calvin, how are we going to solve this issue? And what can, what do we need to do to, to take care of these people? Or pharmacy, how, how is this, you know, we helping solve those problems. I was actually a consultant to both uh, uh, and, and in and out of the White House on several occasions during the Clinton administration and uh, had lunch with Bill Clinton and had his ear, uh, same way with uh, President Bush, mm -hmm. and uh, had lengthy discussions and helped formulate some of the policies that he put in place relating to health care issues. And then, as luck would have it, once you kind of get to be knowledgeable, I testified before Congress numerous times. and. And that's one of the most nervous things I've ever done. Put your hand <laughs> is, <about>. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And they have those lights up there, you know, and you have a limited amount of time, and mm -hmm. they always have a lot of questions. And and then and then I ended up. We had the, all the, this consortium of countries, all the English-speaking countries. Jerry, you never know where this takes you. Well, I I ended up heading up this uh, entity that all of the English-speaking countries in pharmacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we discussed international, you know, pharmacy and healthcare issues. And I, I, I shouldn't say this in a braggadocious way, but I became kind of the go-to person mm -hmm. on a lot of those issues. And it was mainly experience that taught me. And I look back being a legislator, being in the grassroots of I knew what happened and how health care policy decisions affected a physician or a pharmacist or a nurse in the everyday world, because that's where I had been and still was in and, general. And Kevin, you understood also how policy was made, how legislation That's right. I, had, I, had, I knew how to work bills through mm -hmm. the legislature and what it took and how to compromise and how to, how to make you know, decisions that way. I knew the system and those pieces all just kind of fit. Mm -hmm. and so. I don't think it was because I was smarter, or I don't think it was, you know, I'm, heaven knows I'm not the smartest kid on the block, but having experiences in these areas that put the pieces together and just common sense allowed me to accomplish some stuff and make some friends and and uh, really accomplish some things I'm very proud of in, in health care. And, and then, ironically, it was little did I know when I came back and here I ended up being on our Board of Regents, you know, here at OSU, and first issue that I had to deal with was a hospital issue over in Tulsa <laughs> with our medical That's school. Right. And it, it was wonderful to have mm -hmm. some of the experience that I could call on to, to help solve some of those issues. Kevin, just step back to me. Your, your title was Vice President and CEO. Yeah, Executive, Executive Vice, President Vice President and CEO. CEO of mm -hmm. National Community Pharmacists Association. You were there six years? I was there years? six years. Mm -hmm. And it was it was originally, the name of the association was NARD, National Association of Retail Druggists. But uh, just prior to my coming, or actually my first year there, we changed it, modernized the name. Uh, the drug is term drug is still mm -hmm. familiar, but we changed it to National Community Pharmacists Association. And we represent a large constituency in the U.S. And I still, uh, you know, go to Washington and help mm -hmm. them out occasionally with, with issues and projects. Okay. Well, what, uh, what? Speaking of that, uh, what were some of the? I'm, I'm trying to say, what were some of the issues you dealt with in, mm -hmm. and what are some of the current health issues that are still there in your your opinion? Well, one of the issues that was front and center uh, when I 
in my years there was, of course, Clinton had tried to pass the, the comprehensive health care back in the early 90s, 94, I believe it was, and Hillary, Bill Clinton, that put, made a mistake and put, in my opinion, a mistake when he put Hillary in charge of that. Not that she, Hillary's a very smart lady, but being the president's wife, I think it was a very difficult situation for her. But uh, the, the, and there was a group, a working group of people who really were her consultants, and I was one of those people. And uh, they, there were issues, and this was a key time. It actually, eventually, he passed. They, there was something passed, but then it was rescinded. So the seniors it didn't like it, and it was. But my role in that, and, and the idea, uh, his idea, as 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 we all I think share to some degree, is trying to cover all Americans with health care coverage. My belief had always been we can we can do that through the private sector, but we do need. I mean, when you think about what is the issue to me in health care, we do need to cover everyone. In some way, it may be through Medicaid or it may be through private insurance or Medicare. But what happens is, in our system, is the balloon pops out. I mean, if you don't get everyone, it's just cost shifting, and so that affects that issue. But, but anyway, that was one of the issues. Another big issue was importation of dr drugs from outside. Uh, Canada has a the same product is sold in Canada about. 30 to 40 percent less than it is in America by the pharmaceutical companies. And uh, America's patent laws on medicines are designed to, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a close line, but the, to protect innovative products, to encourage them to be developed, they have a patent protection for oh, at least 15 years usually. But uh, as those patents wear off, then generics come out and that drug, you know, usually the generics become the predominant ones. But anyway, uh, dealing with importation of drugs from Canada was a major issue that that, uh, uh, that, that was on the table that I worked, worked on. But, but there's others, Jerry, and internationally it was, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, how we, how we, uh, our system is based on employ, an employer-based model of coverage for insurance primarily. We're about the only country in the world that has that. And one of the things we've done is looked at other models, and I, don't, I can tell you more you want to hear about all this stuff, but it, bottom line is uh, a lot of the other countries are not nearly as uh, innovative or as independent. They're more, a little more socialized and certainly more than America, you know, with their medical care. but. Uh, I'm proud of our system in, in general, and not to say it can't be things done better, but uh, those are some of the issues that I messed with. Kevin, you were talking about the health care issues at the time. What yes. about today? I mean, in, in 2010, there's been a lot yeah. of discussion. So, yeah. so not getting into the politics of the legislation, sure. okay? Sure, sure. We're just asking, can you share some of your thoughts on uh, what U.S. needs to do in, in going forward in the future for its health care policies and issues? Sure, and, and I and this is non-political. What I'm, you know, my my thoughts on it, but but uh, I I, th I do think that uh, you know everybody generally in America does currently. I mean, they get coverage. Unfortunately, a lot of it is under the most expensive scenarios instead of uh, the most effective. And so, uh, you know, we have a system where. Even no matter if you have insurance or not, you know, if you're sick, you're going to get some care. But the, the things that uh, I see that is, you know, important, and, and to some degree some of this is in the, leg the new legislation, but, you know, broader coverage for more people. We do have too many uninsured people, and so I think part of the problem is we've got to cover more people because there's cost shifting. If you don't have a certain population covered, it is going to automatically, you know, then they're going to be taken care of, but they're going to use the emergency rooms and other areas where it's the most expensive. And so to be what I visualize and what I see for uh, America, if I were just drawing up the plan, Jerry, is uh, I think we have to be uh, 
you know, portability, being able to let people carry insurance uh, when they change jobs and that sort of thing and take it with them and coverage for people who have, who have uh, certain diseases are important and I think that's part of what they're trying to do in this plan. But there's a, you know, there's better ways to do it. I'm a believer in a private sector approach that we can have a, we can have to, Medicare has one been wonderful in general for America. It's, it's it, and, you know, people are, it, the coverages are uh, people who are elderly. But the core decisions that we need to make as a country, I think, and we've got to learn to align our incentives with our, with what we want, what outcomes we want. By that I mean, if we want people to be healthier, we've got to encourage and reward healthy behaviors and discourage uh, things like smoking or other things that we know are not healthy. And so I think getting our incentives aligned as a country of, of to encourage better behavior, healthier behavior is a key thing. And really and truthfully, uh, the model that we're working under where the employer is a, is a, is a employer-based model may work and it can work, and I think the private sector, I mean, I'm a believer that we can do most of this through the private sector. I think it's a public-private partnership that we need. And I think that ultimately is where it will end. But we have to make some hard decisions, Jerry, about end-of-life uh, issues for patients. What we have not dealt with in America, and may not for years, but we are 80 Twenty percent of our population spends eighty percent of the health care dollar, and and what that means is is when you or I are eighty five, and they're looking at doing a cardiac transplant that's going to be a five hundred thousand dollar bill, is it worth doing that for you or for me? And I know this is a sensitive issue and it's subjective, but. It just all many cases that we take care of in today's the way medicine is practiced is uh, a hip replacement for a patient who's 95 and and you know if it's your mother or my mother you know we want it uh, but is it practical is it and those are very sensitive issues because ultimately uh, I'm not in favor of rationing health care at all but I do think that there are, there is room to have for us to have a public discussion in America of how we deal with these because things are getting so much more sophisticated. People every day are living longer than their bodies really. Uh, we, I mean, with drugs and stuff, you can keep people alive when their bodies are just gone nearly. And so that's an issue. I, I we talk long and hard, and there's a, certainly a debate, and I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm not in favor of wrestling, but I think as a country, that is an issue we'll have to deal with, Jerry. Kevin, let me back up, and I forgot to ask you, when you were in leadership roles as mayor and on the city commission uh -huh. and right. engaged, what, what were some of the issues uh, at that time, and, we'll, and then we'll, we'll sure. move forward to it a little bit, but right now, at that time, back in, would have been in the 80s? Mid 80s, and, the, yeah. Well, the first thing that hit me when I went in as mayor was, and I knew it when I ran for office because it had been on the table, was, you know, they had closed our city dump out here that near the airport. You know, that's where our, our trash dump was for years, Jerry. You probably remember that. Well, finding a location for another uh, waste uh, <laughs> disposal place, you know, everybody wants to dump the, the trash, but nobody wants it near them. Yeah, we need one, but I don't want it in my backyard. <laughs> That's right. So we had a lot of, I mean, there had been a lot of discussions, and then when I went to mayor, that was one of the one of the key things that was on the table. Well, uh, we finally, you know, and you're never going to make everyone happy on that, but we, Henry Wells, uh, had this property out kind of north and, and just a little bit east of uh, Highway 177 there, and he, he 
he was wanting to get it permitted and, and did. And there was, you know, we had to have hearings and stuff, and there was people who didn't like it. But it was frankly the, it was the least objectionable of the other through two or three sites. And so we got that solved, and it has worked, I think, out relatively well in general out there. Uh, another issue, wasn't a controversial issue, but it was an interesting issue right after I uh, came in as mayor was the uh, the Sister City uh, program we have with Kamioka Japan. I was privileged to take a delegation to Kamioka and sign that Sister City Agreement, which was now 20, we just recently celebrated 25th year, and I'm very proud. Our schools have sister schools relationships, and we have had literally hundreds and even thousands of students who have visited Kamioka, and, and, and Kamioka people have come here and exchanged programs to our university as well as to our public school system. And it's just been, a, a I think, a, a understanding internationally for our better understanding is a very important element. So I'm proud of that little project. Uh, another thing that was front and center was we had, uh, we were fortunate uh, interest rates during our time, uh, my time as mayor, we were able to refinance some significant bond, some bond uh, that we had, uh, general revenue bonds, and saved the city a little money. And ended up, surprisingly, it's hard to think about it nowadays, but lowered the uh, water rates uh, here in Stillwater, which in uh, utilities, that's pretty unheard of. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, issues like that, and then as a legislator, when I went to the legislature, of course, funding for education was always something that was front and center. Uh, ironically, the first, one of the very first votes I had when I went to the legislature, and I served as a Democrat there. The Democrats controlled the, you know, and to be a chairman of a committee or anything, you, you, you had to have a D. I've behind your name. And, but anyway, I, I had, uh, uh, there was, David Walters was the governor, and he had been investigated, and uh, they had found some cash, you know, that uh, that was uh, in a briefcase they thought may have been unaccounted for from some donors, you know, for his election or so. I don't remember all the details, but anyway, the House was having discussions about it, uh, any kind of impeachment process starts there, and and uh, the uh, the, sc the question before the, the the House was: Do we establish a, com a committee to investigate the governor? And uh, man, I, I it was the first time I, you know, I mean, right off the bat, put in that spot. Well, you know, and I didn't. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of pressure, and it was going. I knew it was going to be a close vote. In fact, the governor called me into his office twice to trying to persuade me, you know, make sure he knew where I was going to vote and persuade me because they knew it was going to be a close vote. I voted uh, one of I think two Democrats. I voted to to to, to move forward with the committee. Uh, the vote failed. Uh, because I just thought, I don't know if he's done anything wrong, but that's what a committee's to do, is to, to determine that. And uh, there certainly was some speculation. And so I've, I voted uh, to do that. Uh, ironically, the vote failed uh, 51 to 50. Mm. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, it was kind of ironic, but I, I think it, what it did for me, and. I felt like it was the right vote, and even though some of my Democratic friends may not have agreed with me, but most everybody appreciated the fact that I was my own man and I was doing, you know, I was going to do what I thought or I thought the district would want in my, in my beliefs. And so I, I established myself right then as an independent thinker, or at least a, a vote. And from then on, I never really had I mean, that was one of the hardest votes I ever made, but uh, it was an important vote in that uh, I, I never, I was my own man, there wasn't anybody going to own me or, you know, uh, I, I think I served notice with that vote and I didn't think of it that way at the time, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, that's, 
those issues, there was other issues that we had to deal with down at the legislature. A lot of the uh, the process, it's a, it's a very interesting process. Uh, school consolidation was an issue that came up during that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had, of course, uh, a lot of issues related to just the day-to-day -day stuff. But the process is what you learn. How do you get stuff done? And how do you, you know, work with, across the aisle? And, and, uh, and I, I figured out kind of how to do that. But uh, I learned a lot uh, in that process. Kevin, what, uh, speaking of the issues about the community issues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, town and gown relationships yeah. are always yeah. important. Right. Uh, but I want to ask you, I want to back up, first of all, ask more of a sort of general question in, about Stillwater. You've had a chance to be involved and engaged in, in, in many different roles mm -hmm. and ways. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what will Stillwater need to continue to do or, or to do differently to? move forward as a, as, a, as a city and what do you see the future of Stillwater? Well, uh, I think, you know, having served as mayor, I've served as chair of the chamber. Uh, I'm currently chairman of the hospital board uh, and at all, now as a regent uh, and chair of the regents, uh, uh, kind of across the waterfront, mm -hmm. former alumni, uh, worked with you as a, when I was alumni chair. but. I think what we're doing in Stillwater, Stillwater is, is, I'm very proud of our community. I'm very disappointed in the strife we've had the last couple of years in our city leadership issues. That's that's very unusual. I think it's an anomaly, and I hope that we're getting past that, but it has been, it has been really discouraging to me to see that Stillwater has always been blessed. I think one of the reasons we've been progressive, we've had very low unemployment, we've had wonderful volunteer leadership. I mean, and, and, and whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's uh, working on just, uh, you know, auxiliary at the hospital, we, we get a lot of volunteer support in this community. And our city fathers, the, you know, from Bill Thomas and many before him to Way, you know Terry Miller and John Patton and and Larry Hanson, many other people who served as commissioners. Uh, I think our community has been forward thinking and progressive and successful. Uh, and I think we've back in the 80s, a big part of what we were trying to do when I was mayor and even after that, we, we were successful recruiting Armstrong Industries and Cueva Core and some of the larger uh, employers at that time, uh, Mercury Marine, uh, had come in just a little bit before that too. But but for Stillwater to be successful, we've, we've got to regain that leadership, uh, the community leadership that we're all pulling together and, uh, you know, where we've got issues with uh, firemen and the police that have kind of been out there as well as those are always tough issues. I went through some of those, but we 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 have to uh, as a community. The big 800-pound gorilla in our town, obviously, is OSU, in the sense that you know they provide thousands of jobs for our community and our surrounding area. And uh, I'm very pleased and proud that our leadership there you know, is really trying to collaborate. And I mean, President Hargis and, and his vice presidents, I, I don't think we've ever had better town and gown relations than we have now. And that's a key part of moving Stillwater forward. But we're going to have, we, I think, as a community, uh, we've got to be a little bit, we've got, we've got to ensure, not be complacent about putting people in, in our, positions who can help us uh, move forward instead of squabbling and I think that's the key element and uh, we've got the tools in Stillwater and we're we're getting more high pay jobs than we've ever had with our tech park mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of good things in Stillwater and I sometimes that gets lost in all the hubbub because people don't don't notice that but uh, 
but I think there's some really exciting and good opportunities for us. But we were talking about the town and gun relationship. Uh -huh. How important is that relationship? And you've seen it as, from perspective as mayor of the yeah. city of Stillwater, as you indicated now, as chairman of the Board of Regents for Oklahoma State University. Right. And, and then I think earlier at your, in your tenure on the board, you were working out some relationships with uh, <laughs> Athletic Village. That's right. <laughs> but, Absolutely. And you talk about how, how sort of, you know, in, in a day to day informal way, how does that relationship work? In, and why is it so important to both both sure. parties? Well, that's one thing I think that I, I find helpful, uh, and, and maybe it helps me do a, a better job, is seeing it from a former mayor's position, seeing it from a businessman here in town who's, who's seen the university. As a legislator. As a legislator and the funding that goes with that. Mm -hmm. And then just as a the Chamber of Commerce and, and jobs perspective, I, I, I do feel like that that helps me. I mean, I, I've always been proud of Stillwater. I'm talking about the community. Sure. And uh, I, one of the reasons that I consented to be a regent was I thought it was a unique way to help the university that I loved and the community that I loved, Jerry, because I do believe it's important for someone from Stillwater to sit on the OSU Board of Regents because so many decisions that are made affect the community regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's intended or not. And so I think Stillwater is, would do well to always have someone at the table in that regards. But there's challenges and sometimes people in the business community think, oh my goodness, OSU is the, does this or doesn't do that. And sometimes OSU, I've sat in table rooms where I've heard people just so critical of our community and say, well, why don't they have this and why don't they have that? We're so anti-progressive, you know, we need this. Well, I've, <laughs> I always take up for both sides. <laughs> but I feel strongly both ways. I feel strongly, no, but, but I think having had that experience, it does help me, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that we must collaborate. It's not, you can't differentiate. If it's good for OSU, it's going to be good for Stillwater. And if it's good for Stillwater, it's going to be good for OSU. And that is, rarely do those conflicts, I, what I've learned is we collaborate a lot more than anybody has a clue mm -hmm. as a university and as a city. How does we, that work? Well, yeah, it, the, 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 say we, collaborate. Yeah, when I say collaborate, for example, you know, Things like our airport, uh, much of the land that the city has for that airport has con been contributed by OSU over the years, re agreements and different things like that. Same way with the water issue. Uh, OSU now has a water treatment plant. We had one, we went offline, now it went back online, and we're utilizing it for the benefit of OSU, but we've also did it because OS because the city of Stillwater They've got some problems in their call water line, and they may need to repair that. Well, they need some redundancy so that if they do have to close off that, the, the, the OSU can help them with it. University Avenue and other streets around that Hall we borderline, fame. Hall of Fame, we collaborate on doing those things together. And people, you know, things get magnified about some other issues and I I mean and I know that there's none that's ever been any bigger I don't think than the athletic village issue and that was a unique thing but I will just say that we, we ever almost I mean uh, hardly a day goes by in our business that there's not issues that affect both entities and I just don't I think we I think it's all of us together and I think we need to think of it that way and I know the, the leadership at both the city and the leadership at OSU. We meet, Jerry, and you say, how does it work? We have continual meetings between the, the, the mayor and the legislative council and President Hargis. You know, they have regularly scheduled meetings. And if any issues, if there's issues related to ambulance service or something at, at sporting events, traffic issues, we collaborate and talk and figure out how best to do those things or how to enforce these tailgating issues. They're, we're all in this together, and people uh, sometimes will try to drive wedges, 
And when we go through something like all of the, the, the issue with the, with the uh, athletic village, that was a very strain, big strain. And, uh, you know, it was unfortunate that there were so many, um, uh, I wouldn't say problems, I, I think there were, the, but there was, there was some really serious hard feelings developed over that. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to see that it, it will be uh, a positive outcome. And I'm very optimistic, you know, and uh, no one likes to have to be displaced. And I certainly don't think any of us wanted, would, would ever want uh, that circumstance uh, to, to develop, you know, again. But I, having, I actually came in as a board of regent after the, the there was a couple of lawsuits still on there, but there, but after the, the I wasn't a part of the decision about all the acquisition, but I did meet uh, continuously as a uh, with uh, some of the people at the time, both the city and OSU, trying to help on the the Hall of Fame issue was one of the issues I I, I felt strongly about and getting that you know taken care of and we which we did and it's worked out very well but uh does that answer your question Jerry? Yeah, thank you Calvin. appreciate it yeah uh back when you returned to Stillwater uh, uh was that what year again was uh, that? about 2001 2001 mm -hmm. uh you got re-engaged in a lot of activities yeah and, and we've been talking about some of these and uh but i want to talk a little bit about one of the things that you did is Fortunately for the for the OSU Alumni Association, yeah. you got reengaged on right. the board of directors and moved through to president of mm -hmm. the Alumni Association. Uh, so I'd like to take a few minutes visually okay. about about that. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. So do you, do you recall what years you served on the board, Kevin? Uh, you know, I came back about 2001, <coughs> Jerry, and mm -hmm. you know, really it was. I will tell you candidly, I think it was your and my friendship and your leadership that got me involved uh, because I respected you so much and I felt like that this was a way I could, I, when I came back, I had been, I'll admit, I think I was a little worn out from being up there and, and I was, we were glad, my family and I were glad to get back home. We, ne we went up there never planning to stay. I, I, I agreed to do that for six years. Actually, I said I'd do it for three years and I did it for six because uh, we had a few things going that I wanted to finish, but I, uh, we always plan to come back here, and that's the reason I kept my businesses and we kept a home here and everything. But, but the, but it was a chance, you know, Jerry. You you had taken the leadership in building that beautiful, the alumni association, the beautiful new uh, Conoco Phillips Alumni Center there, and and it it struck me, and you were even kind enough to come and visit, and, and while I was in D.C. there and talk about your dreams and stuff for that, which I were impressive to me and so uh, I think I served on the board there probably from about uh, 2002 to uh, two or three to probably uh, I think about 07 I believe it's about a five or six year time and I was on went on the board and then eventually was elected to the leadership team and moved in as chair-elect and then served as the chair, Jerry, and... Uh, Kevin, do you remember some of the uh, other leaders on the board at that time that you worked with? Yeah, I had a very good group, Jerry, as you know, you know you, and you recall some of them. Sean Copeland was one of the people that were ahead of me, and Sam Combs was uh, just behind me, and then Cindy Batt was a, one of the chairs, uh, who was a key person there. Rex Horning, uh, who's a local banker here, is was on the board there, and Jerry Winchester uh, was on the board, and uh, we had a I thought a very good group, Jerry, uh, as I recall and look back, and we had uh, Judy Johnson, she was on the board with us, as well as uh, uh, the lady uh, Ramona Paul, and. Uh, so uh, I thought a very energetic and good group of people. Paul Cornell I was there too, and who I think is is Paul. Paul is finished. Is he the current chair? I believe, or is he just past chair? 
it, time flies by, Jerry. <laughs> I can't remember. Too, right. But but we've had you know one thing you should be proud of, Jerry, is I mean uh, uh, I think the a lasting mark you you've touched the university in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm thinking about you. And, I mean I've had areas of service in certain areas, but you were an athlete here. You know, you worked on the in the foundation here. I think you may have worked in athletics some after you graduated. Then as head of the alumni association, but I've got to say, the completion and raising the money and completing that alumni center has been a blessing that I mean, far for generations, you should be real proud of because I know it would not have happened without your leadership. And that to me was a, I know we made a very modest contribution to that project, but it was, it was because of you and uh, that, that I decided to get involved. But now as I, as a regent and I look at, you know, how we use that and what it means to our, I don't know how we got along without it beforehand, do you? <laughs> We had some of those discussions. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Good yeah, I mean, remember some of the other uh, challenges, opportunities that we had in the alumni association. Yes, uh, you know, thinking back, Jerry, we, you know, uh, I think any, and I learned this in my association work. You know, when I was in in the D.C. area, even though we had a lot of resources as a national association, and and and, and the alumni association does too. Associations, it's it, funding is always an issue because uh, it's generally a membership-driven entity, and membership dues never really cover all the things that our members want. I think you know that better than anyone. So what we have to do is uh, really focus on, is there, are there other sources of revenue or, or things we can do? And people want so many things. I mean, it's easy to get fragmented, one of the things I think you've done, and I think uh, Larry Shell is, is 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 doing too now, and that is that we're focusing on trying to do the thing, not all things for everybody, but focus. I mean, on what we do well and do them. I mean, homecoming is a the hallmark event on this campus, and probably the best best homecoming in America, and biggest. And it's the alumni association. A lot of people don't realize that that's the alumni association's event. And so, uh, you know, some of the recognition of, of seniors and students, we have a big recognition program that the alumni association does, and you've put that in place. And uh, I know there's a lot of honor and pride in the, in the past chairman or past presidents of that group and the leadership council we now have. And so it's... The challenges are are many, as you know, uh, but we have to find sources of revenue. But I think our goal as an alumni association is a good one, and that is to be a friend maker for OSU. And uh, I think we I think we do do that. Kevin, in your opinion, uh, is it important for alumni to remain engaged, you know, with uh, with their alma mater, and if so? What are some? What do you think some of the legitimate roles for alumni? Yeah, you know, through the alumni association and in other ways as well. Well, I think it is important to make to stay connected. You know, our our connections for life. Uh, it, it rings true. I think very clearly. And you know, we have a lot of other connects. But the to me, we usually lose students quite often the first few years. I mean, this is sort of historical, I think. You could speak to this better than I can, but right as they graduate, we'll lose track of them, seems like, sometimes. And I wish we didn't. I hope we can find ways to, to, to keep them online. I know we incentivize membership, give them six months or a year, first year membership, but, you know, and then they get out and they work four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and all of a sudden they they, they, they get they get to thinking, you know, coming back is more fun and being following up sports teams and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> that disconnect, I wish we could close that gap some way. But but uh, it is it, it, it is so critical because uh, really the heritage and the life experiences and the connections for life really it, it it's what it is and 
when you talk to, I mean, my fellow regents and other people that I'm around all the time, you hear so many wonderful stories about, you know, what they did at OSU, or what their mate that they met, uh, or how they have their business associate, or what doors it opened. Uh, we're trying to tell some of those stories and these success, <coughs> these successes that some of our 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 people and alumni have have had. But I think the association, it, in the absence of it. And I know some schools have different arrangements than we have, Jerry, but I think that you lose a measure of pride if you don't have someone out there flying that flag. I, I think that's what we do. I think it doesn't matter if it's a social event at a bowl game. It doesn't matter if it's homecoming or helping these young students recognizing scholarship or, or activities that they that they do and uh, or just being a communication vehicle about what's going on on campus there's a role uh, and if it's done properly the it, it will create pride in our university and we you know the foundation does a wonderful job their job is to to fundraise but our job I think is to work with them to friend raise because that ultimately become ultimately we become those young people become uh, uh, supporters. Kevin, what uh, what how do you feel about the current organizational structure of the alumni association? It, it changed a little bit during, during your tenure yeah. and, and and its relationship with the university. Again, this sort of dichotomy where you get you got to see it as president of the alumni association. Yeah. Now you're looking back as chairman of the board of regents. Well, I tell you, Jerry, and this is you know. You may need to cut some of this out, or you may not. I'll let you. I, you want us to be candid here, sure. I think. And and I've always, I, I've, I, when when I was chairman, you know, we had this discussion, and we had a, a kind of a blue ribbon group from the foundation and the alumni association because there is some sense and there's a belief out there that, hey, we get mail from everybody. We can't separate, you know, and. What are, maybe we need to consolidate some of these entities. You got the posse out there now that's doing promotional stuff too, and you've got the foundation, and you've got the alumni association. And I know I hear it still about. Well, it seems to me we should those maybe the foundation and the alumni association should, should you know fold it into each other or to to uh, figure out a way to you know we don't do we need them both. Well, my belief is, if there, there is a, the, the alumni association struggles, I think, to some degree with financial. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate with the credit card program and stuff, and I think Larry Shell would say this, and I know you've experienced it that we, you know, struggle financially to, to do the, everything that we want to do, and uh, and I I worry about that. But I do believe that there are efficiencies that could be captured, and that's one of the things that I hope, had hoped that we had out of that group would come. Some of the backroom uh, opportunities where uh, you know we could share some of the operational stuff, like a, you know accounting or. Uh, some of the we do share record keeping in some ways and that sort of thing but where we could uh, collaborate and I've thought you know that if we I know we have some space in the Alumni Association building uh, you know if we could uh, had space to lease or have some of them you know have their people there I, I don't know if they're crowded in their building or not, but I, I guess I've been a I'm an advocate of collaboration, and not necessarily of just doing away with one or the other, but where we can collaborate, doing those things, sharing costs or space, and trying to economize to the benefit of of both entities. But I don't think either has to lose their identity if it's done properly. Now, 
there are those I know from discussions with some of my fellow regents and others that probably think, you know, they do need to consolidate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not at that point. Some of the discussion come out about uh, different sort of missions. You're talking about sort of yes. fundraising or the connections yeah. to life mission, yeah. basically, and mission for fundraising. Right. Sometimes aren't exactly the same. Missions. Right. There's They're not the same. Yeah. There's a, yeah. Things. There's not. There's you know they they can overlap to some degree, but they're not really the same thing. And I think what complicates this too, Jerry, is 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 the pop. What do we? What is the? What do we want from the po the posse? You know what? I know for years one of our functions in an alumni association was to put on these uh, like bowl game functions, and people love that, and I think very worthwhile. It wasn't a money maker for us, but it was. A friend maker, you know, but my sense is now that's kind of the posse or athletics is doing more of that. Well, you know, how much do they want to do, or do we want them to do, and how does that affect the the uh, alumni association is a factor. I think I suspect at some point in time we need to put all our heads together and get those three entities at the table and make sure we know who's responsible for what, and it may be just the way it is, is fine. Mm -hmm. But I think that's going to be a continual, disc you know, uh, do you see it that way, Jerry, kind of? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, and probably mean, you and even more, uh, talking about the relationship between the Foundation and Alumni Association, at times it's more the policy and the Alumni Association in terms of, yeah, uh, not 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 in any negative sense of saying, no, it's but it's, it's who needs to be doing what. That's and, right. And in and, and, and public, uh, who do our, you know, who our alumni want to c communicate with in those areas? It's exactly it confusing. Right. It does. It, to me, it it's and and I think we all know that mailings and all the the communication goes to our to people. A lot of it's the same people, and it does get even confusing to them. I know, mm -hmm. and so I I don't know the, for sure the answer, but I think that is a discussion. Uh, when you ask me, he's the, and I, I will say there's some regents that, that are of the opinion that, you know, um, the, the role of the f uh, alumni association is diminishing. Kevin, can you uh, offer some thoughts on how the alumni association should relate to and interact with university administration in the regions? Well, uh, I think that we've had a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, system mm -hmm. uh, in the past and I think you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well comfortable with that uh, I think we could there may be some enhancements that could be made for, uh, I like the idea that you as uh, head of the alumni association is a vice president mm -hmm. and you were attended the vice president's leadership meetings as I understand it every Monday or whatever time the president would meet and I'm assuming Larry Shell does that now, as far as I know, he does. And that, uh, that to me, is a very important place that you have to, to table to communicate and be, you know, keep the Alumni Association apprised. And, and that's a critical factor. I think we have a president who values the Alumni Association, which makes it, makes it communication between us and the regents and, and, the, and the executive uh, area pretty comfortable. And then uh, I think there probably, uh, I do believe, uh, and I've mentioned this to Larry, that I think an, an annual report to the regents would be helpful mm -hmm. uh, simply because we renew a contract each year and it's pretty perfunctory, but I really think having said as a regent, I think the board really should hear either informally in one of our committees or or formally at a board meeting a little bit of a report on uh, specific things that the year we've accomplished or need to accomplish a kind of a uh, you know uh, we've it's always approved I don't mean that but it's rarely I don't think we have uh, uh, a written report or an oral report to 
you know, to justify it necessarily, and I think that would be helpful. And it, it, it sort of makes everybody sit and think, hey, what, what can we do better, or do we need to change this or that? And so so I, I would advocate for that as an improvement. That I don't think it's happening now. I th it seems like do, you used to. You used to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you used to do that, and I don't believe it's happening as far as I know now. But, but uh, that I'm, I'm generally, I, I feel pretty good to interface. Uh, I don't. I mean, I think that getting some face time with the regents would be helpful, and that's what that would give. I think you alluded to that the president also serves ex officio on the board of directors of the alumni association. That's correct. And he gives reports yeah. periodically, and as you said, then the then the president and CEO of the alumni association serves on his executive committee. But it seems like, and I like your suggestions. There's no, that uh, more interaction communication between the regents. Yeah, the I think it would just. I think the it just makes it more. Uh, obvious the things that the alumni association are doing uh, if if the regents get to hear directly from the president or the CEO. Mm -hmm. Kevin, and I appreciate your, your insights on that. And I might ask just one kind of follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Can you share some special memories uh, uh, about and highlights of your tenure with the alumni association? Yes. Well, of course, I, yes, I can. I, I, I enjoyed our time working together, Jerry. I mean, you and I have been friends for so long. That was probably a, a highlight, frankly, I will tell you. You know, we're, you're an old football player. I'm an old has-been baseball player, and we were here around the same time so we could commiserate and talk about sports, and that's kind of a personal thing. But still, that adds to the value and the enjoyment, you know, when we would – go to f functions or you know do things uh, that 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 you wouldn't have if 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 you weren't didn't enjoy each other's company but i think the things that i look back i think one of the thrills that was always pleasing to me was i i, I got you you got me that orange jacket that blazer man <laughs> i that i'm so proud of that and i wear it you know uh homecoming is always i mean in the parade and stuff uh, i always always wear the wear it and the homecoming parade's a great experience i that was one of the things i remember as chairman at that time i yeah you know I, it, it was it was a it's a great event the student driven program that i think we're all very proud of and uh i think the thing that uh, one of the things that i worked on and we were able jerry to acquire that parking area that you know there we've worked out a deal with the university now on that, but I think that was strategic to making the alumni so uh, center uh, use more usable and efficient, and having a place for people to park for a lot of reasons, and and uh, that was kind of an internal thing. But uh, I know we you and I worked hard, and frankly, thanks to you, uh, with some far-sighted negotiations with Mr. McCula, the university is reaping the benefits of that. Uh, option on that other property there that they had and took advantage of so yeah you alluded to that uh, in since i think kind of in trade off that yeah. association as right. an entity on it is, is is now turned it over to the university yeah. but uh, i guess we can say this today but, but mr mckeel was not really interested in selling it to the university. No, sir. The Cambridge would not have done that. Uh, no, he and did sell it to the Alumni Association and then we were able to get it back to the university then eventually. That's exactly right and I you know you and I were involved with getting Getting the original, the 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 deal done in the parking lot and, and everything, but and and uh, and may have should have just kept that option for the long, you know. I mean, uh, but but that's a whole other discussion. But I guess as get well, back as well as the other parcel. It's right. It's right. Had an option that's what I'm right. saying. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I mean that's that's progress. And uh, but it those kind of things, you know, evolve. But the association should have the credit, you know, uh, for that being where it be available, I guess you could say. <laughs> and, uh, but though that, that was an, an event that I was proud that, that, uh, that I kind of worked hard on our board to get some of that all done, and uh, you did too. Uh, and I think other things that you always enjoy, the, I mean, just an enjoyment part of it, Jerry, is that, as chairman of that, is 
like a ring ceremony and, and, and the awards program, you know, and our, our Hall of Fame induction. It, you know, we have some great successful people out there and it's just always an honor, I felt like, to get up and, you know, represent uh, the Alumni Association and recognize these people, distinguished people. So I, I it, it was a pleasant experience. I can't think of any bad experiences I had, really, you know, and uh, I'm sure, I hope you feel that way about your tenure, not just during my time, but I mean, the overall, your service, uh, you know, you should, you, you, you when we, th when people think of the Alumni Association, they think of Jerry Gill. That's really, I mean, and I don't mean that as a reflection on Larry or at all, but you're, you're, you're the man. So well, I appreciate that. <laughs> a lot of the folks involved in that. Well, it was, and I know people before you, we've talked, you know, and I, I think the world of those, those folks too, but, but uh, in this modern era, you're the one that led, flew the flag most. Kevin, uh, another opportunity that you had then, as we've talked about, is the mm -hmm. OSU Regents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I put yeah. that in quotes. Opportunity, I opportunity, yeah, that's right. Quote, in quote. Yeah. Uh, just uh, asking you a little bit about uh, your service there, your, your current service chairman, but what uh, kind of back, what year were you appointed to the board? Uh, let's see. I sometimes forget that, that uh, I think I was appointed in... Uh, Oh five, I believe. I think I'm in my just starting my fifth year in my fifth year. Kind I of overlapped with your years present. Or yes, uh -huh. or maybe just right. year after that. Uh -huh. That's yeah. right. It was it was uh, you know, and I was honored when the governor decided to appoint me. I, like I mentioned to you, I had always felt like that it was a way to serve our university and our community, and uh, frankly. Uh, the importance of, of having a Stillwater voice. We've been fortunate that, that Lou Watkins is, was on the board when I came on, and she's been a, has lived in Stillwater, but she hadn't always lived here. She, she, but she has uh, been on that board and been on the board and uh, and lives here. So we actually have two voices on there now. But, but it was uh, uh, the the governor was uh, was gracious and given me the opportunity. I, I hope I've done well at it. I, I, I've learned a lot, Jerry, and there's a lot of important decisions made there. And we not we don't just oversee OSU, of course, that's our largest flagship, but we oversee the Connor State, uh, Northeastern Oklahoma, A&M, Langston, and Panhandle, which are all, have a significant impact on Oklahoma. And the other OSU campuses. Yeah, the other OSU campuses, Omuggy, Oklahoma City, and Tulsa, in addition to those. And Langston has, they also have campuses in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. So it's it's a very busy, and uh, I actually am in my second year as chairman. I Normally, uh, the chairman serves one year, but uh, as I've, the person who was precede, was following me, uh, ended up having to step down because of some personal commitments and and so he could not move up and so the board asked me to serve another year as chairman in some ways it's a little bit easier living in Stillwater to, to do it perhaps uh, or at least to be more available so I was consented to do that and I've been honored to do that but uh, I'll be finishing that up next spring or next 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 summer I should say but it's a great experience. I wish everyone, every cowboy could do it. It's, you have an appreciation. It's hard work if you do it right. But I'll tell you, Jerry, the thing, and I'll, I should say this, uh, uh, regarding all these other, these are different aspects, both as a regent, as an alumni, and as a citizen here in Stillwater, what really matters at the end of the day, and it's true in the regents, I mean, we make some decisions that we hope will be good for long-term of our community and our university, but it's the relationships that count, Jerry. What I remember is, it, I mean, I remember some of the things the Alumni Association, but what I remember more is our friendship. What I remember more, you know, when I was mayor is there was a lot of issues, but those folks who served with me on the council who became friends and 
you know, pe reliable people, those relationships, that's what matters at the end of the day. Same way in the legislature. I don't miss all the hubbub and the <laughs> politics, but those friendships really do matter. And so at the end of the day, all of this is probably, you know, you make some good and bad decisions, I'm sure, but your friendships that are made are lasting. I think that's important. How's your how's your perspective about the university changed since you've been Regents? <laughs> you've had all these other opportunities yeah. to affiliate with it, but now from Regents' perspective and that focus and that lens, how has it changed? Well, that? I'll tell you, Jerry, it, it changes in that I thought, it, you know, I knew it was a big organization. You, you know that, you know, kind of just from just being around. But there, it is so much more complicated than, than I thought. Uh, and uh, I think that in general, um, you just have to, to get your arms around it. Uh, there are so many things. You can't keep track of all of the, the minutia, details. What it has helped me is, you know, the most important job I have as a regent is hiring the president. And then my belief is we hire good people and we let them do their job. And as regents, we, you know, there's certainly some perfunctory things that I have to do as chair and I'm glad to do and attend and represent OSU. But we'll, the, the vastness of the influence of our alumni and of our university and how we, you know, uh, issues from what our entrance requirements to being true to our public, uh, you know, public institution heritage, to being able to manage uh, faculty issues and uh, financial issues. I mean, it's it is a we have a good staff that helps enormously, but it is a very very dynamic and moving. If you if you if you miss a meeting or two, you're way behind. It it really evolves. Are you surprised all the time, all oh, the staff yeah. materials you go yeah. through? The, I mean, what what does it take? I've been had a conception of what it takes to be a region in terms uh, of time commitment. A lot can of people you, think it's kind of pretty perfunctory now, yeah. and I will tell you the board, our board of regents, A and M board of regents, are uh, are we really are actively involved. I mean the decisions. It doesn't just. It's not, we're not just a rubber stamp of, you know, I mean, we try to support our president and administration. Certainly we do. But we do our homework. And when we're talking about building a building over here on campus or something, we want to make sure when we hire the architect or the, or the construction manager and stuff like that, we're involved in all that directly. So it, but it is massive. We have at least eight, anywhere eight to ten meetings a year. And those are two day or day and a half meetings, and my volume of of uh, just material to read before an average meeting is probably at least three inches tall. I mean, it's uh, out for for every hour I spend in a meeting, I'll probably spend three hours reading documents and information because in each on our agenda at every meeting, it's not just OSU, of course, is a long, a big part of our board meetings, but then we have the other schools all have their agendas that they present, and it doesn't matter if it's setting tuition or looking at fees or dealing with personnel issues, all of that comes to the board eventually. And uh, we try to have it all, we have committees that work and they function properly and they meet and We'll, they'll have recommendations to the full board, and we try to keep the meeting times manageable. But to do that, we have a lot of interim meetings, phone calls, and it's it really is a it is a very time consuming. It's rewarding in the sense that hey, you feel like you're doing something that's helping students, and it's and helping the university and helping the community. But but it's. It's not without a prize. It's not without a prize. It's more than just a trip it's more to the bowl game. It's, yeah, it's more than just a trip to the bowl game, and it's more than just a. And but I will say this: I have learned this as a regent, and you've learned. When our teams are winning, 
everybody's happier. <laughs> you know, if we're getting kicked around, you know, I, I noticed it even in the drugstore, mm -hmm. you know, in Stillwater or in other towns, you know, if we're, things are going well athletically, whether it's a wrestling or whatever the season is, baseball, everybody's in a good humor, Jerry. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, when, but when it's bad, you know, the, the, the opposite is true. Clearly when you're in the region of Stillwater. That's right. You, there's no shortage of people to converse with. That's right. <laughs> we talked about a lot of things, but, but uh, could you describe, you know, there's the formal relationship, and you sort of look uh -huh. at this, yeah. that, that the regions have, working relationship between the Board of Regents and the University Administration. Well, yeah. how, does the, how does that practically work out? Well, it uh, generally we have uh, our connects most of the time in our general basis is with the president and his vice presidents. Uh, we'll, at our meetings, usually they'll bring forth, you know, uh, issues that may be mm -hmm. wastewater treatment or depending on what area it is. But we'll have uh, interactions with the provost and with uh, the president and, and in certain of the vice presidents. And, of course, being in Stillwater and knowing so many of the people over the years here, the faculty and stuff, I'll, I, you know, I interact with various ones uh, as chairman. Uh, but in athletics, it's the same way, you know, being uh, we, uh, our athletic director, Mike Holder, he's generally the spokesman for athletics. But, but you know, when it comes to hiring coaches, for example, a new coach, well, we'll uh, the board is always directly in Involved and looks at those, you know, the, the, those people and and uh, signs off on whoever that hire is. So it, it's generally the president and his vice presidents, but uh, the chairman of the board has a little bit more exposure in the sense that, like at graduations, usually he or she will make comments. Uh, I've recently been asked to speak at one of the faculty council meetings, and quite a, I mean, there's a lot of just different functions that that the chairman attends or is invited to attend. Dedication of all the buildings and stuff when we bring a new building online, but I guess formally the contact is with the, the president and his his vice presidents in general. Is that kind of is that what you were asking, yeah. Jerry? Kevin, we're, we're uh, appreciate you coming back again. We're continuing sure. the interview from, you know, from earlier. Uh, well, I, I talk a lot slower than probably some of the others, so it takes longer. <laughs> <laughs> you have more to say, baby. <laughs> I don't know. But we were, I think we were talking about the uh, kind of relationship with the regents and, and administration. Yes. But I want to ask you specifically about, uh, you know, from a practical perspective, how did you as board chairman, how do you interact with, with President Hargis? Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, we do have, uh, you know, as as the, as the board overall, and certainly as the chair, it probably requires a little more communication between the president, or President Hargis in this case, and and myself as chairman than other board members. But uh, but we try to keep open communication, and obviously I have full access to to uh, the president and his office and his assistant Gary. Uh, and he certainly doesn't hesitate to contact me, either of them, either. So we, we'll have phone conversations, usually at least uh, every, uh, or probably uh, several times a week, or uh, some cases uh, uh, we'll have, you know, set down meetings when it's necessary. And we try to do that uh, at least once a month, aside from our board meetings. Now, we have regularly, scheduled calls and that we in the interest of communication for our full board including me as chair we have scheduled in between our regular board meetings uh, a scheduled time that because we can't have a quorum on those calls uh, we have two separate calls where the president reviews items and agenda that we just talk about issues that are, need to be dealt with or talked about. No decisions are made. It's all, you know, just FYI for information only. But it helps communicate to the full board and to the chair exactly things that are going on that either, you know, may be pertinent to just knowledge 
uh, or uh, it may be something that he's preparing us that he wants to bring forward to the board at our board meeting and so so forth. So we have those scheduled. Uh, there's probably seven or eight of those a year, and it's it's an hour call. We'll do four regents uh, one hour, and we'll do another four regents another hour, and uh, that way we keep the communications open. But the president and I, uh, quite often in my responsibilities as chair, we're at events a lot together here at Stillwater, you know, uh, recently the convocation to recognize outstanding faculty. I mean, there's just always some something, uh, ball games, of course, present opportunities. Uh, and I usually am in the president's and regent's suite there uh, for the football games when uh, when uh, we play football at home. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of opportunities to interact. And uh, from a business standpoint, dealing with decisions, uh, it, it's very convenient for him to call me when a serious issue arises and uh, let me know something that needs to be uh, brought to our attention and vice versa. It's an open it's an open policy. And I don't know how it's always been with other chairs, but living in Stillwater, Jerry, I think is a little bit advantage for me because and probably in a disadvantage too. It's easier to know what's going on, but sometimes they'll call on you for more things than they would someone who are outside of Stillwater and have to had to drive in. Of course Burns may may think but it's sometimes a disadvantage to have his region share right in his home town. Yeah, the other side of it is I can keep up with what he's doing. Exactly. You know, easy. Exactly. But uh, we're proud of uh, we have a great relationship and I'm very proud of Burns and and his top assistant, of course, is Gary uh, Clark, who's former regent himself and a wonderful person to work with, too. So we have a great relationship, uh, the board, along with our president. And uh, I couldn't ask for someone better uh, to work with than those two people. And you bring up a good point, uh, Calvin, about uh, uh, Gary Clark, his vice yes, president sir. for, mm -hmm. for, for uh, university relations, right. is a former regent, but then of course Burns himself is a former, former regent. regent also. That's and, right. And so these two guys have been on both sides of the fence. Yes. And uh -huh. does, does that do you think help? I think it does help because I think they're very empathetic toward uh, the issues that they know hit that, that we care about, and. They understand communication so often is the key thing on, you know, keeping everybody up to speed. Uh, President Hargis is one of the busiest people I know. I mean, he he extends himself, you know, not just here in Stillwater, but all over the nation, traveling and seeing donors and alumni and promoting the university, and really is a great ambassador for us, uh, both politically and in every other way. But uh, because of that, you know, it, uh, the timing we spend together and visiting face to face, uh, we have that available when needed. But I must say, it, he and Gary both, because of their past experience as a regent, I think understands uh, the importance of keeping that communication going two ways. And it's not uncommon. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's, Burns just like to use me as a sounding board and say, what do you think about this? Could is this something that we would want to do? Or and and oh, quite often there's just good there's good respect on both sides, and so I think that's the basis for a good a good atmosphere and communication. Yeah, well, let me back up. We had a previous interview. And I was still supposed to do my intro. Okay, okay. go ahead. You got to get here again. That's okay. Scott. I got you. My name is Jerry Gill. And today is November twenty second, two thousand ten. I'm visiting Calvin Anthony. The Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this uh, interview is for the O-State Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History mm -hmm. Research Program. Right. Appreciate you giving my plug. Hey, get, 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 get that Thanks. in. Get that in. Uh, Follow up one other aspect on, on uh, Burns. I ask you, how do you how do you feel about the leadership team he's putting together? You know, I'm thinking about Provost Robert Sternberg and some yes. new deans. How, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, I think one of the things that to be a really successful leader, you do need your team together. And it takes time. And as you know, there have been some changes. And I think anyone who has been a CEO or been responsible in a responsible position understands that. We've had some great uh, staff at Oklahoma State and faculty. But I think Burns has assembled a, uh, a quality, quality group of people that he uh, has at his disposal to help move our university forward. 
Uh, Dr. Sternberg, I mean, is a good example. I mean, one of the top flight, most respected academicians in the country. Uh, because his interest is in land grant mission, the land grant mission, we were able to persuade him to come to Oklahoma State. I think he brings a, a really um, a valuable asset in that he has the academic credentials, but he also has the common sense to understand that what we are and what we can do. I particularly like his discussions on mission. Uh, admission issues and stuff, but not just Dr. Sternberg, but Gary Clark that we mentioned earlier, and then you look at all of our others, the VPs that, you know, uh, David mm -hmm. Bosserman, uh, fine chief, mm -hmm. kind of chief financial officer, is retiring, mm -hmm. but I fully expect we'll have a wonderful replacement for him in that Mary, process. Mary Crosby, the new dean of the school, yeah. the school of yeah. business. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an excellent, excellent dean. A combination, I think, of someone who has had experience in the private sector but also has taught and has the academic credentials that our faculty and staff can highly respect, but he also has that practical everyday experience that makes him a good leader, I think. So I think that group of people and, there, and, and the others, I mean, I, I don't mean that at the exclusion of, of many of our other leadership people who are, he has on his team, but, you know, you're only as good as the people around you. And I think President Hargis expects excellence, and he's, he's going after the best people, and it shows. How would you describe his leadership style? Well, I think his leadership style, I guess if I, you know, it's hard to put in one word. Uh, I think he is, uh, leads by example, number one. I don't think he asks any of his staff to not uh, go where he's willing to lead. It doesn't matter if it's giving. It doesn't matter if it's time and effort. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, in any capacity. I think he expects excellence and settles for uh, nothing short of their best, and that's his nature. And he's, you know, I think he, he, conservatively aggressive. I guess I would say. He, by that I mean he he loves people. He and Ann are ambassadors, and I mean they their appointment schedule. Jerry, if you and I had that, it would kill us, I think. But they're out there every day in, on campus talking to students, meeting with donors, just doing the literally hundreds and hundreds of things it takes to improve our relationships. And he's excellent with the media, and, uh, and he understands fundraising, and certainly has the political savvy to be successful at the Capitol. That combination, and I don't know what you call it, if you call it... Uh, you know, maybe aggressive is the right term, but when I say aggressive, I mean he's not wanting to maintain the status quo. He wants Oklahoma State to move up in the national rankings and help us uh, become one of the top 100 or 50 public institutions, and I think we will with his leadership. From having had the opportunity to visit with him a couple times previously, he's indicated he said one of his titles was, was fundraiser-in-chief. The yes. University. Yes. Uh, and he takes it real seriously. Really does. Uh, he expects his deans to spend as much as 30% of the time fundraising. As a region, how do you feel? Is that the proper use of his time, do you think? I think it is. I think what we're seeing in higher education, Jerry, is a movement uh, where it is becoming uh, the president's job, if you will, or description, is less attuned to the everyday inner workings of the university. That falls to the provost. And I think we tend to see the presidents, not just at Oklahoma State, but really mostly throughout the country, uh, being people who are the face of the university, who are the chief fundraiser of the university, and the chief political figure. And uh, that's not to say whether that's a good model or, or the, the way that it has been, I, I can't speak to that. But my sense is that what we see are seeing now is, you know, uh, the provost handling more of the day-to-day -day academic and, uh, and uh, some, to some degree operational uh, issues and the president out there creating the goodwill and fundraising opportunities that makes us successful. Our president, President Hargis, is excellent at that and that's, I think, what, you know, we've seen. I mean, we're in the middle of a billion dollar campaign. It's the first time any institution of higher education in Oklahoma has ever even launched 
something of that magnitude. We're well over halfway there. And so that doesn't happen without a great deal of push uh, on, on the chief, the, the, the leader. Because when you start dealing with the donors that he's dealing, he, people he deals with, they want to see the president. Uh, they want to see the president. And President Hargis knows how to approach those people. So I think that that really job description has changed in that regard. In your opinion, what are what are some of the key current issues, uh, uh, you know, opportunities, challenges, yeah, uh, facing the university at this time? Well, you know, it's easy to say money's always. I mean, that always tops the list. You know, we need funding. You always sort of start in there. Yeah, yeah and, and I and I'd be the first to say that certainly probably is. Uh, uh, certainly one of the key factors and, and we do need uh, the amount of money that the state of Oklahoma is able to put in higher education. We have seen as a part percentage of our budget has continued to decline and we don't and that's no different than we're seeing all across the country. It's no different in Oklahoma. So what that means is that from a funding standpoint, Oklahoma State has to look at other opportunities to get the resources it needs to operate properly and efficiently and provide a quality education. That means more research dollars. We have to work harder to get federal research and other research dollars. It means that uh, there's more pressure on tuition and fees increases from the student on the students. It also means that we have to look at more fundraising through our foundation. All of those where, you know, this major part of this campaign right now that we're involved in is for scholarships. And so it's, we just have to look at other uh, resource ways and we also have to look for ways to conserve and be frugal, cut back in areas that we, that we don't need. That's certainly an issue, but uh, there's other issues e equally important, I think. Let me, can I just probe okay. you account, because you really sure. brought up some good points there. Mm -hmm. On the, the appropriation, how do you, what does the appropriations picture look like for the coming year? For the coming year, it looks pretty bleak, although I will say that and I, uh, this previous year, everyone, you know, had some cuts. Higher ed had less, much less of a cut than, than most of the other A state agencies. I think we only got, we got by with just about a 3.3% cut overall in higher education, but, but other departments had 10, 15, even some the highest 20 percent. This coming year, I think it's going to be tough. We, However, we're seeing the last several months a little gleam of daylight in that our state tax revenues, if you'll notice compared to previous year, are creeping up. And we're actually ahead overall of our budget projections about almost 3 percent. And so what that means is that doesn't mean we're going to have a bunch of money to spend, uh, but what it means is our deficit will be less than probably what we had last year. We, we had about a $1.2 billion deficit in our state budget last year. We funded it with, you know, the rainy day fund. We funded it with uh, some stimulus money and uh, some tax, uh, I mean, some cuts in the department. The, the, the various departments. I think we're looking more at five to six hundred million dollars shortfall this year. I think higher ed will, will, we will, you know, I think we'll fare. The, I think the governor thinks that's an important, education is important, so I think we're going to, we'll have a, a you know, uh, I'm hoping at least a standstill budget, but that's still all of our costs are increasing, health insurance and everything, you name it. So <clears throat> even a standstill budget represents a, a loss for us. And uh, so there's a challenge there, but I tend to, I'm a hat glass half full kind of guy. I believe that we will see a rebound uh, in Oklahoma. Most people are predicting that the next year, the 012 budget is when the biggest difficulty will will come because we have had some stimulus money still filtering in that has helped plug some of these holes. We'll see. I'm hoping our economy will be back in full swing by then and we won't see that. But that's probably more than you want to hear about that. The, there yeah. are other challenges. 
you look like there will be a possibility of another uh, uh, tuition increase this year, likely? Well, uh, we certainly have not made any decisions on that, and I'll tell you what I really, this is my honest opinion. I think uh, we did have a, uh, about a 5% increase last year. Uh, we've tried to keep it very modest. The board is very sensitive to, you know, the cost of education in Oklahoma and the escalation. And if we get funding to where we are, the, the state regions for higher ed have asked for like a, I think about like a, I believe it's a 80 something million dollar increase, which isn't very much overall for all the schools. And if, if we were to get a modest increase or close to that, or even a standstill, we are preparing and have prepared our president Hargis and our leadership because we knew these tough times were coming. We have put aside a little reserve to help us, so we might not have to have a ta a, a, a increase in tuition if if things you know fall into place. But having said that, I have to reserve really the answer till we seek more clearly. Uh, we don't know what we'll be looking at. Kevin, we're talking about challenges. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, enrollment management, enrollment retention has been an issue. How, how do you feel about where we're going now? And yeah, that, uh, well, that's the, the when you ask the question, I think I, I must, on what are we challenges OSU face? I, and, and as we talked, as I said, you know, funding is always a, probably the first thing, but but the others are relation related to enrollment uh, and the issue that you just asked about. Uh, Oklahoma State kind of went through a little swoon back about four years ago, three or four uh, years ago, and our enrollment had dropped compared to what it had been in several of the previous years. I'm pleased to say because of our President Hargis focus and the board's focus uh, that we are now, uh, we had about a, what we believe was about a 20% excess capacity that we could take more students and uh, and grow the enrollment without increasing costs significantly in our to their system and thanks to uh, Kyle Ray uh, who has worked extremely hard vice president in charge of this area we have really seen an enormous we had a six, about a four to five hundred uh, student number increase last year the applications are just booming this year way beyond what we've ever had so our capacity is doing I mean is being filled and uh, the problem with enrollment and the battle that when you think about challenges we as a university face in Oklahoma is we have a declining graduation of seniors in Oklahoma compared to four or five ten years ago even so when you have that declining number of graduates, you have a smaller pool to solicit. So we're seeing and we're doing more aggressive enrollment uh, recruitment outside of Oklahoma even and encouraging our friends from Texas and other places to come to Oklahoma State and being very successful at it, frankly. And scholarship dollars will help that. And so that's that's very important a part of the, a very important part of this uh, of this uh, campaign. Our competition, the University of Oklahoma and other you know, major universities outside the state, they tend to be able to offer a lot of scholarships, so Oklahoma State has to do that. Uh, so in, that's, that's a little bit about enrollment. Another area that we have really focused on, Jerry, that is a challenge to us is the area of retention of students. Uh, we have looked at the numbers and are not happy with how we compare with the rest of our conference and our peers in the number of students that we lose from their freshman and sophomore year. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, I'm sure. I mean, when we've polled the students, we've done a lot of research on it. They, they, the most common answer is funds, and uh, we hope the scholarships will help some degree for that, but, but also there's other reasons. And so we have made a real concerted effort to improve that retention because those are students I mean if you keep them in your system they not only graduate and it helps their them personally and and their their income as they graduate 
but it helps the university fill its capacity. So we're focused on that and we're looking at our advising system, trying to duplicate the ones, the areas like Ms. Middlebrook or uh, Martha McMillan, and those are a couple of the ladies that help a lot in difficult situations, students to retain, keep them in school by helping them get in the right classes. We're trying to create a model where we're doing better and I think we have not been as good as we should be in advisement. And uh, that is a major focus. And we have, we'll see how it works, but we are seeing signs that we are retaining more students. And so uh, those are some big challenges. And another challenge I will say for Oklahoma State is our faculty salaries and staff. We've got to continue to be able to attract the best. We've got to pay adequate salaries. Now, there are other benefits that we provide very well for our, for our faculty and our staff that do uh, help us retain good people. You know, the retirement program is one of the best. The, uh, our health care policies are, are good, but we still have to be able to pay the kind of salaries it takes to attract top people and not lose our people to other major schools. So that's a big challenge for us, and it's hard to do that under declining economic times. But we recognize that as a, as a problem and are focusing some of our energies and hope that these endowed chair dollars that the state matches with the money that we're raising will give us eventually, it's not a quick fix, but over a period of time, give us the ability to really do more for our faculty. Kevin, how do you feel about facilities? Is that part of our challenge? Facilities are always a continuous issue. I would say we're we have we have invested thanks to the capital bond issue of about 2002, I believe it was. We had one in the mid 90s, and then we had a second one. Uh, we are now. I think we have we have been on a building program in at Oklahoma State that is here in Stillwater has we've invested almost a million dollars on structures and uh, and it's wonderful I mean we've got the Murray Hall renovation we're in the middle of the of the student union renovation we've got the of course the football stadium and all the facilities related to that we have this new classroom building just down the street from where you and I are Bellman. and we got the Bellman Center for Science and and uh, just uh, I mean that's the most in the bond issue that was it's a 70 million dollar building was the most expensive most expensive one item in the in the entire uh, uh, capital campaign that uh, that the state of Oklahoma had so we're I think infrastructure wide there's always improvements we need and we are we're moving those I can tell you different things we're doing you know but uh, I think that part we are in better shape because I, I, I think we have capacity within what we're doing to grow more uh, it's getting filled quickly because our enrollment is increasing but our we are upgrading our facilities in the places we need to what what emerging priorities and opportunities do you uh, you know for excellence do you see at Oklahoma State University in the future well I, I think uh, our goal uh, as regents and as the president and, and, I, and I think probably all of our faculty is we want to be one of the top public institutions in America. Uh, we want to be listed in the top groups, in the top first or second tier of the U.S. News and World Report when they start listing public institutions. And we're not there yet, candidly. Some of it has to do with graduation rates, which we're working on, and that's one of the things we're correcting. Some of it has to do with just plain funding issues, which we're, with a billion dollar campaign, that, that will help. And uh, we have the infrastructure going, I think, pretty well. But I think our interest is, in, is becoming, you know, a really top flight institution. We provide a good education, but there's little pieces that we need to put in the puzzle to let us get into that very top tier. And things like our entrepreneurship program, uh, that uh, thanks to Malone and, Sa and, and, and Sandy and and uh, Ms. Mitchell, I, I can't remember her name, but they have given us uh, a, you know over fifty million dollars for this 
for this entrepreneurship camp, uh, program, which kind of infiltrates throughout many of the various degree areas, not just in the College of Business, but it's kind of across the board, which I feel strongly about that we need to, doesn't matter if you're in pre-med or uh, many of these other uh, science areas and mm -hmm. engineering, you know, being an understanding of financial statements and stuff entrepreneurship uh, requires is, is critical. And so I think some of those positive things, uh, the quality deans that, we're, that we are hiring, all of that points us toward becoming uh, a much better institution. That's just not to say, Jerry, that we're not happy where we are and we're proud of that. But as our president has said, you know, we, we've got to keep moving forward and we've got to keep improving. Governor is, is your you know, region certainly is chair of the region, so you have, I'm sure, a lot of kind of visioning kinds of meetings and long-term planning. What, uh, how will OSU of the 21st century need to be different than OSU of the 20th century? I mean, how, how will it need to change and do things differently for Phyllis Land Grant Nation? Well, I think there's a, you know, futures, there's no, it, it, it's changing dramatically. I, can't remember the exact statistic, but I was at a presentation a couple of weeks ago, Jerry, and one of the comments that the presenter made was talking about education and saying that, that two-thirds of the jobs that we are training students and educating students for will not be available in 10 years. Now that tells you something. I don't know if that's exactly correct, but what I do know is that in our wildest dreams, Jerry, and you're in my era, we never could imagine what has happened technologically. And now, you know, uh, so many of our students graduate uh, needing knowledge about the computer world and programming and all the things that were just coming into the forefront when, when we were students. So I, what I believe is that the things that will help us and the things that will change is we've got to prepare everyone to live in a technology age. Distance education, distance learning, the ability to be and understand a world market. We're, we're you know, as a land grant, you know, uh, university, and we have always sent, and, and the focus on agriculture, we've sent people all over the world over the years educating uh, agricultural specialists in Thailand or Turkey or other parts of the Ethiopia. world, Ethiopia, and we've got many connections over there because of that. But we're in a world market today where you don't have to send people. I mean, you just the information is there, and you can communicate them, communicate with them in the blink of an eye. We're doing one of the, I think, a more progressive thing here, and it may seem small, but I predict it'll be be very big. Is the cost of textbooks are so expensive you know, for our students that we have concerns about that. So we're doing an experiment this year on our freshmen. We, I think we gave, I don't remember exactly, maybe it's a hundred or more uh, iPads to students where technologically they can take notes, they can get copies of the professor's uh, uh, lectures, uh, he can put slides, anything uh, all accessible through this iPad. And we're looking at it to see uh, if it in fact is something that will help the students be more successful, which is what I told you earlier we're about, and improve the cost of not having to buy these expensive textbooks that sometimes are hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're seeing textbooks uh, for in some areas cost almost as much students as their tuition. It's unbelievable. So. Uh, technologically, we've got to be prepared and improve, you know, as a university and be prepared to help our students know how to succeed in that in this new marketplace. It's a worldwide market and it's technological. So those are just a couple of the things I think, Jerry, but it's it's changing so quickly. Who knows what it, what, what, what else it's going to look like. So maybe you can speak more comfortably about is what, uh, what, uh, traditional strengths what well, you need yeah. to continue to build on? Well, I think the best, I'm very proud of the leadership of our university over the many years. You know, I look out here at these beautiful grounds and I think of Dr. Bennett and 
people like Dr. Calm and Wilhelm and many of the other people that we've just been so blessed to have as leaders here, Jerry, when you and I are in school. And I, I think that we have a great basis, and I'm proud of our heritage. Uh, sometimes people get nervous, hey, we're going to, you know, leave our land-grant mission or get involved in this and that. We have a medical school in Tulsa and all these kinds of things. But I, I, I think we have the basis that we have is is we, we, we probably have, if not the best, amongst the top five agriculture programs in America. Uh, we have a wonderful dean and Dean Whitson, and, and, and have, who is a continuum of many other great deans. But, and, and the same in, in many of our other sectors, but I only point them out to say that, that we value that heritage. And uh, we want to be a scientific, I mean, we, we have contracts and research programs with NASA, uh, our medical school in Tulsa is rated amongst the very top in its categories in rural medicine in, in America. And uh, I, I just find it that, that the, the, the quality leadership that we've had as a school and on what I'd say minimal resources has postured us well. And if we can, you know, the funding is with the programs our foundation are doing will allow us to offer scholarships, so many more scholarships. And and I think, I haven't said this area, but we have, I think, taken a little more progressive way of admitting students and we're even looking at it more. I mean, I'm all in favor of, you know, having good students with good ACT scores. But Cherry, there is so many other predictors of success that that does not capture. Uh, I grew up in a little town. There was 12 students in my high school graduating class. Uh, I always say I finished in the top six, you know, Jerry, but I was <laughs> really joking. I was actually badly toward. But, but my point is I came to Oklahoma State, didn't have a background in any sciences. The only science class I had was uh, general science in high school, chemistry, no chemistry. Uh, no trigonometry, no physics background, and my brother and I both came here, and that was our interest in the area of science. Well, we couldn't have gotten into school today probably, because if you take ACT test, it only measures what you've been exposed to. It doesn't measure your will to learn, it doesn't measure your heart, your brain, and what you're capable of learning. And so, I only say that to say that I think there's other predictors we need to include in that, and we're working on that. And I'm proud of uh, Provost St uh, Sternberg, who is one of the leaders in the nation on looking at other things like participation in clubs and participation in, you know, things like FFA or working while you've been in high school and other things that help you show leadership skills that probably are equally good predictors of a student's opportunities to succeed. And so that's, I guess I got off on a tangent there, Jerry, but I want to get that's that strange. in. <laughs> okay, I'm looking, uh, kind of casting a broader net. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people realize the OSU A&M, uh -huh. you know, or it's actually A&M uh, Board of Regents has uh, responsibility for four different universities and all the branch campuses of Oklahoma State University. That's right. Uh, can you briefly discuss kind of the system and how those education entities collectively uh, impact uh, each other in the state. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of an interesting model. I think legislature set up kind of the way we have this the oversight, not just of Oklahoma State and the A&M colleges, but uh, some of the other schools, you know. Uh, one, uh, uh, some, Northeastern, NEO. Uh, uh, yeah, the schools that we have, in it, well, number one, Oklahoma State system is the Stillwater is the flagship campus, of course, but we also have a large campus in Oklahoma City, one of the most it's fastest growing campus in the entire state, any school system. And then we also have a Tulsa campus, and that is uh, we are on that campus in addition to our just our upper division classes that we provide there. We also have a medical school over there in Tulsa, the College of Osteopathy osteopathic medicine. And then we also have out one in Okmulgee, a campus, which is primarily related to technology, does a lot of work, uh, education and culinary arts, 
and is uh, unique in some ways in the many uh, the degree programs it provides. And then it, that's, that's the OSU system. And then outside that, we oversee Langston University, which is just down the road here at Langston, uh, Oklahoma. And they have a campus in Oklahoma City and Tulsa also. And then we also oversee Panhandle State, which is out near Guyman at Panhandle. And uh, it has a strong agricultural mission. And then we have two junior college, what we call junior colleges, or two-year you know, uh, schools. One is at Connors State in Warner. They also have a branch campus that's growing in Muskogee. And then we also have the Northeastern Oklahoma A&M, which is in Miami, Oklahoma. And uh, they have a campus in Grove also up there. But you can see it's a pretty, it's a pretty big uh, we, we getting to and from the meetings that we get on each of those campuses at least once a year for our board meetings but uh, they at each of our board meetings they have time on the agenda it doesn't matter I mean how long it takes we cover they all have their equal opportunity to lay out the issues and meet with the board does it present any particular challenges uh, kind of bring sometimes all those interests together well, I tell you, I don't think, I, I view it as a, a positive combination in this, and I mean it but in this way. Now, from the Oklahoma State standpoint, as a comprehensive, we have a little, it's a little different model than some of the others. But having like a couple of two-year schools and a couple of other four-year schools, it's, we can compare information. It helps us be better decision makers because, you know, we look at what's happening at one campus. Now, each has their own individual qualities, but you can look and compare, well, how much does it cost us to provide education here? And here? Well, one school, maybe it's costing us, you know, considerably more. Or there's other issues. The numbers can get out of line, but, but you have comparisons to look at those schools, and it helps you, I think, analyze your strengths and weaknesses and, uh, and ways to improve, make decisions to improve, because you can look at panhandle and say well look what they're doing with this money or this project uh, and here at Langston another four-year school we've got their issues and so you by having I'm not saying more is better necessarily but I think that comparative comparison opportunity is helpful but it does it is it, it's a lot of reading Jerry and really if you care about and learning and stuff I can tell you as a regent it takes a lot of time. Uh, I took a speed reading class when I, because uh, I wasn't a real good reader when I, it did for no credit here at OSU when I was a freshman. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Cause you're, you're usually quite yeah, a bit now, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful <laughs> I'm a fast reader now. Yeah. Well, I want to know that, you know, if we talked about earlier, you have a special interest in athletics. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, let me back up first one and ask you, overall, how do you feel about the general state of OSU athletics? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm bullish on it, Jerry. I mean, I, you know, I just heard driving over here, this may be news to you, we just won our 50th NCAA championship today. Wow. And our cross-country team up in Terre Haute, Indiana, it's back finished to back, first, back-to-back you know? -back national championship. Wow. We don't even have a track, I mean, a oval track, Jerry, that qualifies for NCAA competition. But Dave Smith, who's, our, we do have a wonderful cross-country track, and I've asked him, I said, how do you recruit these students to come here for track, and you don't have a, a, a the track's got a sag over on one side. He said, well, he said, Mr. Anthony, he said, what I do is when I come, I bring them in, you know, and we go, I drive by the track usually late in the evening or it's getting dark and I just point well this is a track right here you you can see what we've got here you know and then just keep going <laughs> <laughs> so they don't pay too much attention but but I, I distracted I guess from the, the the key discussion but overall very proud of it and I'd be remiss if I didn't say you know not just about winning that 50th national championship but we set an all-time first time ever this past weekend we have a football team that has won 10 games in a regular season and uh, hope to win 11. 
the coming up with uh, Bedlam coming up on sa- on Saturday. But uh, it's not just about those two sports. I mentioned the uh, track and the cross country and, and football. But, I mean, you look up and down, I'm very proud of what we're doing in res- wrestling, and we all know the heritage we have there. But more importantly, our students, I had the pre- pleasure of working this year on a there's a every 10 year evaluation the NCAA requires you to do a self evaluation of your your athletics and i mean evaluate not not money but are your students graduating at a rate equal to your rest of the students uh, are you having any issues with uh, diversity are you giving the women's teams the same opportunity you are the men's and a whole series of things that we had to analyze and I was so pleased to look and see what uh, the successes that many of our athletes have. Uh, You know what happens in in this day and time as you know is when a student athlete gets in trouble or gets picked up on a DUI it makes big front page news and it's very unfortunate and we have you know half the basketball team makes straight A's or something like that and you know that's that never that, that, that didn't hit anything. But overall, our, I think, co- uh, athletic director, Mike Holder, and the staff over there and the coaches, they have really, really done a wonderful job. And I give them a great deal of credit. And something that I, sh- you know, I think I should say here is that's one reason that we are growing as an institution. People sometimes hate to admit it, but Many people come to our university as students or as donors because of the success that our athletic programs have. Now, that's the reality. It, and many times, is the front porch of the university. When you have, it's statistically proven. When you have a winning football team and sports teams, that your enrollment will go up 10 percent. And uh, I'm talking not just at Oklahoma State, but across other campuses uh, nationwide. So. I'm very, I think it's a key part of the success we're having as a university, and, uh, and I think, you know, uh, our program, Mr. Pickens made some enormous donations along with many other people, uh, and Ross and, and uh, Billy McKnight in this most recent uh, uh, campaign of, are leading the billion dollar campaign, and uh, the thing that they have done in addition to contributing the enormous dollars, uh, Mr. Pickens, Malone Mitchell, and the McKnight's, and others, frankly, are, it's set a new mindset about giving at Oklahoma State that has made everybody kind of feel like they want to pitch in. You know, there was a time I think people thought, well, it could go two ways. People would say, oh, well, big, big money, we don't need to do anything. But that's not happened. What has happened is everybody has said, well, that's great. Maybe I can do a little something. And so it's worked out to be very positive. Kevin, you've been a people person <laughs> all your life. And a key to your success has been your ability to develop and maintain friendships and professional relationships with individuals at all sure. levels and walks of life. Uh, can you share a little bit about your philosophy working with people? Sure. I mean, uh, you, you and I have been friends for a long time, Jerry. I, I suspect we're both cut out of the same cloth on this issue uh, in many ways, but my mom and dad always taught me and all my, my brothers and sisters that you treat everybody the same. You don't, it doesn't matter if it's the farmer that doesn't have anything but the shirt on his back or somebody like that, or the banker that drives a Cadillac, you know, whomever they are, you treat them the same with respect and you smile and you, you know, learn to listen a little bit and pay attention to people but always show respect and it really it's not it never is out old-fashioned or out of style and uh, what i think has helped jerry for people like me and and i put you both both of us in that same category is is you know i don't think we think we know all the answers we know we don't I've I, I've known I've never was a rocket scientist, but I've all, I've also learned that hard work and a will to listen and then try to to be honest 
puts you in a class that you're usually a step ahead of a lot of people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's pretty basic. Uh, but you've got to sort of kind of enjoy people. You know, there's some who just don't enjoy being around people. And I'm not that way. You're not either. I enjoy talking uh, to people, especially if it's the things they care about. Uh, and we can learn. Usually you learn something. And when I campaigned as a politician, here in Stillwater, the first campaign I had was a mayor campaign here. Well, my slogan was willing to serve and ready to listen, you know. And I happened to see one of those cards the other day that <laughs> reminded me. And I thought, well, I wasn't very smart in many ways, but I think that's what people want. They, they want you to want the job and be willing to do it, but they also, they don't expect you to be a rocket scientist, but they, if you listen to them, even if you don't agree with them, if you give the courtesy of listening to them, they'll respect you. You know, so that's that's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> you, you, st you still you still use that campaign advice, huh? Yeah, that's right. You've uh, you gosh, Kevin, so unselfishly given of your time over you know many many years, your time, your yeah. talents, your financial resources, uh, right. and on behalf of Gone Water and your community and many other good yeah. good things. But why have you given so much time, for example, to Oklahoma State University? Where does, sure. where does the passion come from? Well, that's a good question, and sometimes I ask myself that, and my wife, I know back in the days when our, we were trying to raise kids, and you know, and, and uh, I stepped into politics a little bit and stuff like that, and she was all for it and very supportive, but, but I, you know, I, I love I want our kids to play little league sports, and I remember coming. I'd come home, you know. I didn't stay at the Capitol when I was a legislator. I drove back and forth, and I'd hustle back, and I'd come to the, our, one of our kids' ball games. You know, I was assistant coach or helping out some way, and I'd be having a coat and tie on, <laughs> be out there coaching third <laughs> base or something, <laughs> sweating, you know, in the summertime. But, but. Uh, I tell you, I think where it stems from, uh, Jerry, and there's a part of us that, I mean, I've been very fortunate in a, my, my business uh, opportunities that the good Lord has blessed me, and, and so I've been able to have the income that I needed to, uh, and the staff and the people working with me, that I could involve myself in some of these other opportunities. That's one thing. But the most important is my dad, he served on the Kearney School Board for about 25 years <laughs> and the little old town board for a long time. And not because he, I mean, there, was only, there wasn't that many people who was willing to do it, who were willing to do it. But he thought it, you ought to leave it a little better than you found it. That's what he always told me. He said, son, just leave it a little better than you found it. And so I think probably my motivation to try to contribute. Uh, one is I cared about our community and I thought this was a way that I could, could help it. I cared about our university. It's been a wonderful place in our community to, to live and our businesses have thrived because of the success of our school and our community. And so you feel like, hey, I owe a little something to, to try to pay back. And so we've tried to give back a little financially with what modest means we have. And my wife has gotten involved in the, like this domestic violence shelter. She's chaired that board for about 10 years and, and they've raised the money to build, or now have raised enough money to build a new shelter for battered women. And, and so we've we sort of felt like we picked our spots, what we could do. And I've been lucky at the, you know, the chamber and the mayor and all the hospital and stuff. But it, I've, in each case, I've learned so much, Jerry, that it's. I found this when I went to Washington. I thought, like, ah, there's a lot of people here a lot smarter than me. I wonder if I can, can really effectively do this because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of alligator shoes and thousand dollar suits up there, you know. But what I learned was quickly that if you just stay to the principles that got you there, which are the basic, you know, being, being gracious, not a smart aleck, but doing your homework and preparing and, and knowing what the issues were, it, it's, it wasn't hard to be successful. And uh, so I think it was my father and my mother's influence is the bottom line. They, they, they felt like 
some sort of public service we owe we owe to our communities. Well, speaking of that public service, Kevin, you uh, your community, your alma mater, have recognized you yeah. uh, many times. Yeah. Can you think? Uh, can you share some uh, some of the awards that you in recognition received that have been especially meaningful to you? Well, I have been. You know, you never do things because of any kind of recognition, but invariably some of those things come if you if you're unselfish. I think, and you work and just take care of your your work. But uh, well, one is. You know, I, I was allowed to be elected uh, national president of the Alumni Association when you were the head of that. That was a great honor for me. And uh, I've, you know, I felt very proud about that. In my, in my, uh, in my world, in pharmacy world, uh, candidly, probably the most I have been, I was selected as, uh, it's a, the name of it would not mean anything to anybody, but it was the John Dargavel Award by one of the national associations that sort of has recognized the most outstanding pharmacist in America. What was the name of the Dargavel? Dargavel Award. Dar 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 Gavel. Dar Gavel, and mm -hmm. it was named after John Dargavel, who was uh, back in the 40s, a oh. uh, big leader in pharmacy. And then I, the American Pharmaceutical Association recognized me with an award, uh, the Hubert A. Humphrey Award, which is the award they give to the most influential uh, political person in pharmacy and uh, that was quite a nice honor and I've had a lot of others you know citizen of the year award yeah, still yeah in the, in, in, and from the community standpoint citizen of the year in Oklahoma and Stillwater was a, is a great uh, uh, recognition and uh, something I really take pride in because that's really where you live and and where you exist and you appreciate the people I recognize you know, and I've, I've, you know, I was, I'm now incoming chair of the Oklahoma Heritage Association, which is a really unique and interesting statewide association that its mission is to tell Oklahoma's story through its people. And we do the Oklahoma Hall of Fame and things like that. So uh, I was very pleasantly surprised when they asked me to serve as an officer in that group. But, Kevin, this is a, I know you're a humble guy, but this is a serious question I you think sure. about a minute. How do you hope people remember Calvin Anthony? <laughs> well, that's something I haven't really thought about much. You know, Jerry, not that you're I, yeah. you know, one foot no, in the grave No, yet, no, no, I try. Well, I tell you what, I, you know, I, the best thing I think anybody can say about it, anybody, frankly, you know, is uh, that uh, they were, he was a, a good parent you know, that he was a God-fearing man and that, uh, you know, he cared enough to make a difference in his community, his church, his family, and uh, and his, any area that he had an impact on. I, I don't know how, you know, you never know how so sort of history will treat you, but I expect most people, I hope most people recognize me as I think I probably, uh, eh, kind of country, you know, I, I, I learned when I was in Washington and, uh, you know, I'd probably talk a little slower to some of those people. And I'd make speeches all over the country in, and all over the world, frankly, internationally. And, and I would, people say, well, I love to hear you talk because I talk slow or something, you know. <laughs> but there are some people who misjudge you and think because you talk a little slower that you think a little slower. But that's, that's a big mistake. I learned that with some of my Southern friends who are a lot smarter than me, you know. But uh, anyway, I, I hope people will recognize me as just a, a good guy that they'd like to, like to sit down and, uh, you know, have a hamburger with and shoot the breeze, you know, or play around the golf or, or shoot a few baskets, you know, Jerry, or go hunting like you and I have done before. Uh, I don't consider myself a... Uh, I mean, I, I think we're all a process in work, no matter what, you know, uh, the stage of our lives are, that we're still, still in the making, so to speak. But I, I hope I'm treated well, you know, in that regard, good thoughts. But I'm sure I've made some enemies when you've been involved in the world that I've been in. I'm sure there are people who think I'm a hoodlum and a crook and a <laughs> who knows what else. But 
I don't worry and spend time dwelling on those kinds of things. Uh, I think most people will say I was, uh, I, I, I did well.